when one looks about our country and at other countries, it's clear that things are in a complete disarray. There is societal meltdown, it seems, at least if one watches the mainstream media. There's rioting, looting, protesting. The protesting seems to just go on and on and on. It doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to really end. Um, and some of these organizations that are actually doing the rioting and the protesting are openly Marxist. You can simply look at their websites to see that they are, in fact, openly Marxist. And what this is a sign of is that Marxism has made significant inroads into our society, into our country, its institutions, etc. Belladad, in her book, The School of Darkness, chronicles how step by step the communists took over various institutions and areas of our country. When one looks at the behavior of communists, not just in the way that Bella Dodd describes it, but in ways in which many books describe it, some of which we will be, some of those books we will be mentioning in this series, um, they the, their tactics, when you look at their tactics, it becomes very clear and their behavior, um, what they consider acceptable on their part rather than on the side of their opponents, has great similarities to diabolic psychology and tactics. More and more writers are drawing the connection between the diabolic and communism. We see that with the book most recently produced by Tan called The Devil and Karl Marx. There's other books that actually discuss the same thing, noticing that their behavior seems almost diabolic in relationship to how they torture people, the people that have been killed and murdered throughout the last century um, by the regimes that actually have communism as their primary political structure, etc. And so one of the things that this series is going to do, this is going to be a series on the similarities of the psychology and behavior between communists, Marxists, and demons. In other words, we're going to parse out a little bit first. I'll give a short description of the behavior and attitudes that demons have and how they engage in spiritual warfare in relationship to us and the similarities that has to the way communists and Marxists behave. Before we go into that, I want to give a short definition of communism, Marxism, and socialism. The website Wikipedia, which I do not consider a very reliable source, however, for the sake of the discussion, especially in relationship to the public who considers it a reliable source, if you look under the entry Marxism, it defines Marxism as a method of socio-economic analysis that uses a materialist interpretation of historical development, better known as historical materialism, to understand class relations and social conflict, as well as a dialectical perspective to view social transformation. In other words, it uses class conflict within the context of an economic viewpoint in order to transform society or to transform a culture or a nation. In relation to communism, if you look in the old Catholic encyclopedia under communism, it makes the following statement. In its more general signification, Communism refers to any social system in which all property, or at least all productive property, is owned by the group or community instead of by individuals. Thus understood, it compromises communistic anarchism, socialism, and communism in the strict sense. Communistic anarchism, as distinguished from the philosophical variety, would abolish not only private property, but political government. Socialism means the collective ownership and management, not of all property, but only of the material agencies of production. Communism, in the strict sense, demands that both production goods, such as land, railways, and factories, and consumption goods, such as dwellings, furniture, food, and clothing, should be the property of the whole community. Communism, in the strict sense, is also distinguished from socialism by the fact that it usually connotes a greater degree of common life. 
In the words of Reverend W.D.P. Bliss, quote, socialism puts its emphasis on common production and distribution, communism on life in common. Another source that is very good on communism is the Dictionnaire Theologique, which is in French, but if you can read French, uh, I would recommend that you take a look at that because it has a great deal of solid information regarding communism. As we will see later from these definitions, socialism and communism only vary in minor degrees, that in point in fact, socialism is a stepping stone to communism, which is what Marx and other people actually said. The church has more than once condemned communism and refuted its errors. It's not going to be the place of these videos to do that. I'm not going to go into a philosophical analysis of communism. One can simply read the documents of Leo XIII and the subsequent popes on communism. So, People can review the modern popes and their documents on it. Any cursory search on the internet will provide these references. It is also not the place of these videos to give a detailed analysis to Marxism and communism, but to provide the viewer with the sense of the psychology behind communism and how it is specifically similar to and in many ways the same as diabolic psychology. There are ways in which diabolic psychology is similar to the psychology of communism, and these can be broken down into four categories. The first is epistemological. The second is relations to adversaries. That is, how do they relate to their opponents? Third is the modes of operating, or modu, modi operandi. That is, how they proceed in their uh, take over various locations and how they proceed in their own behavior. And finally, the relationship to morality, which we will complete this series on. This first part, I want to talk about in relationship to the areas of attack, that is how they attack uh, people and things of that sort. I want to talk first about the epistemological side. Now, epistemology is the science in which we study, it's a branch of philosophy, in which we study how man knows reality, ultimately. And so, this epistemological consideration in the first part, so there will be a series of videos, short videos, on areas of their behavior that touch upon epistemology, that is, how they control what people know and how they know it. So the first area that we want to take a look at is control of information. It is all about epistemology in this sense. In other words, the way they control what people think, the way they control people's behavior is by controlling people, by controlling the knowledge that they obtain. That is, they control the sources of knowledge. So in relationship to demons, how do they affect our knowledge? Well, demons have access to our bodies, and part of our body is the brain. And the brain actually performs a variety of different functions. It's the material side of the intellect. And part of that is the imagination. And also what St. Thomas calls the cogitative power. It's the part of the brain that has the ability to make associations. So once something comes into the imagination through our senses, then the cogitative power makes certain associations in relationship to that. The part of the, there's also a part of the brain that does interpretation in relationship to emotions. That's also part of the cogitative power in the Thomistic sense. And then we have an emotional response. But because the emotions are the physical, they, that is, the soul acting through the body has its emotions, then in that particular uh, motion, it, because it's physical, demons can actually influence it. They can increase it. They can block it. They can actually cause emotions without the person having anything even in their imagination. In certain cases, you see that with people who are possessed. And so very often what they'll do is they'll uh, put something in the imagination. They'll put a perspective on that. And then the emotions are moved by what's in the imagination. 
And so then the person will have an, a specific emotional response. So demons can move the emotions by the perspective they put on our image and our imagination, what we're thinking about, and then they can move the emotions. Now, sometimes they just do one or the other. Uh, they rarely do the moving the emotions without something in the imagination, but that does happen with people who have diabolic obsession or who are possessed. But in normal temptation, they normally don't really do that. What they usually do is put something in the imagination, and then they'll try and drive the emotions in relationship to it. The point being is, is we can't know anything, St. Thomas Aquinas says, in this life without the imagination. So even when the immaterial part of our intellect um, which he calls the possible intellect, which has the ability for self-reflection and judgment and things of that sort. We can't do those things without the imagination, because it depends on the imagination, both for its content, which it extracts into concepts, which the ancient intellect does. And then it also needs it to make judgments. That is, we convert back to the image in our imagination in order to make judgments. So if I want to know that all dogs are four-footed, I have to look at the image in my imagination to, to imagine dogs, uh, and I can't imagine any dogs that aren't four-footed, unless, of course, they've lost them unnaturally. So I have to... Uh, I have to look at the image in my imagination. So demons control the information by affecting the image or trying to control our images in our imagination. This is done through ordinary temptation. Every human being has experienced it. They will simply put something, in, put a perspective on the image in the imagination and then, uh, or they'll affect the imagination. Um, and that's just ordinary temptation. But they can also, when a person reads things or looks at certain things, they can put a commentary, that is, they can put his perspective on it to affect the person's input of information. In more extreme cases of obsession, possession, and oppression, they will actually block the person from coming to knowledge about the truth. And the reason being is, is because once the person recognizes the truth of a situation, the demons hold, because demons, their hold on us is in large part in connected to error. That is, we have an erroneous understanding of something, and once we come to the truth and the knowledge of that, then we are freed from their grip. And so this means that the demons want to control what people know in order to control their behavior. Um, this they only want to allow information which promotes their viewpoint. They manipulate the images and the talking points that we experience. The exact same thing is true in relationship to communists. They try to control all the sources of knowledge. Then even in those that aren't under their control uh, directly, then they will try to block them so that people can't get access to alternative forms of news or information. They will also, uh, whenever the image is presented on the mainstream media of a particular event, you see this very often with certain news media outlets, they will have, they will show pictures, pictures of the rioting. They will literally show in the background buildings burning, but then they'll say it's largely a peaceful protest. So there's this constant manipulation of the perspective or the image in relationship to it. In the end, they just want to control the information that people have. In this video, we want to talk about how demons attack the imagination more specifically or in a couple of specific ways. Demons psychologically harangue the person and do running commentary. What does that mean? It means that they will constantly put in someone's mind a particular perspective or something in relationship to the thing that the person's thinking about. For example, a wife might have actually a pretty decent husband, but he will constantly put in her mind a perspective that he doesn't love her or whatever he is doing is bad or whatever the case is. So there's this constant running commentary. Anything that comes into the person's senses that is contrary to what the demons want the person to believe is immediately affected in the image. In other words, they just constantly manipulate the person's viewpoint on things. 
They seek not to allow the person to have the freedom of thought, but to think only what they suggest. That's the goal, to get to the person, get the person to sign off on the patterns of thinking that they want to form or shape in the individual. God permitting, they are able to launch any form of attack against the person intellectually. But if the person tries to refute it, in other words, very often a person realizes there's something wrong with the way this, I'm seeing this, they will manipulate his thinking process so that he doesn't have the ability to climb out of that pattern of thinking. In other words, if he tries to reason his way out, the demons have already gained control or certain influence over the imagination and what's in there. And so anytime the individual tries to think of something else, they will simply, as part of the running commentary, shift the view so that the person can never seem to kind of climb out of this obsession or this viewpoint. They accuse the person of everything under the sun and retaliate emotionally if the person does not accept what they want in their imagination. Otherwise, if the person tries to fight it or reject it, then they will retaliate against the individual for doing so. Demons, when you counter them, they fight all the more. In other words, the more you try and shut them down, the more they tend to fight by trying to affect their imagination. Demons expect you to take their abuse and if you don't, they are very vindictive. So the only way to ultimately shut that process down is to simply ignore them. Stop thinking about the thing that they're trying to, to put in your mind. Get your mind cleared. And then later you'll see that the reality of the situation. Communists behave in very much the same way. Their side can say anything it wants in relationship to the individual or anything in reality. But you're not permitted to say anything. In other words, just as the demons shut down the person trying to sort their way through the type of, sort their way through the temptation or through the viewpoint that they're putting it, that, that, but they don't want the person, they don't want to permit the person to do that. So the communists do the same thing. They're permitted to say whatever they want, but you can't say anything. They can name call. They can launch complete false attacks. They can use constant ad hominems. Ad hominems is a logical fallacy in which you don't really address the argument that is being presented, but rather you simply attack the man that is presenting the argument. You see this done over and over again. Um, but others are not permitted to point out their faults, weaknesses, errors, or what have you. In other words, it's a one-sided uh, process. If you do that, you will be torn down in front of others. They will viciously attack you. They will do hit jobs on you in the news media, etc. In other words, they try to shut you down. And if they can't shut you down, then they simply shout you down. In other words, if you try to present a logical argument, they will simply shout over you, especially when they can't counter it. This is actually true even of demons. Very often a person will look at something from a proper point of view, and the demon knows he has no way to combat that, so he simply tries to override what the person is thinking by sheer force. And this is simply the same way that communists behave. The only day, way to deal with the communists, ultimately, is to not give them a platform or a voice. This is the key thing. People can't give them an opportunity to present their side of it because otherwise they will simply try to dominate the situation. Communists abuse and destroy people and things and they treat you as if you are an object. And if you don't go along with their thinking, they will go after you. They are not interested in mere external compliance. You have to think the way they think, and if they don't, they will bludgeon you into submission. People that defend themselves are persecuted. We see this all the time. And so the moral to the story is do not give them a platform. In other words, ignore them. This is not only true in relationship to those in the media should just stop covering what they're doing and saying. But at the same time, then they should allow a proper intellectual approach to be given to them without the communists trying to interject with all this. I realize people are going to say, well, you know, a true debate has to have both sides of it. Communists do not debate. 
Demons do not debate. They simply try and force their will and viewpoint on people. It's not a true debate when you enter into it with them. In light of the last video, in which I talk about how demons actually attack our imagination, uh, most of what I described there was actually what you see with people with diabolic obsession, although they do a little bit of it in relationship to ordinary temptation, where they constantly do the running commentary, etc. What their goal is, is to get you again to sign off on their viewpoint. And one of the hallmarks of the sign that you're under diabolic attack is lack of clarity, lack of intellectual clarity. It's true that demons can actually falsify clarity where a person thinks they're actually clear, but those around them realize this person isn't thinking clearly at all. But generally speaking, their goal is to, by putting that constant shift in the image and the imagination, is to ultimately destroy your clarity so that you don't know the truth of it, so that you will make a choice that is harmful to you or to others. So this is what they do on this running commentary. You never gain clarity. This is why with people with diabolic obsession, I tell them, look, don't try and gain clarity when you're under attack. You're simply not going to get it. You have to do what is necessary to go on the offensive against the demons and stop the attack or, or get your mind off of the object or do what is ever necessary to distract yourself so that you can get your mind off of the object that they're affecting in your imagination. And then over the course, once the demon loses his control over your imagination, slowly over the course of time, then you will gain a certain amount of clarity. The same is true in relationships to communists. They do constant propaganda. Now, one of the ways that you brainwash an individual is, in fact, it's the primary way that you brainwash an individual, is most people, by the time they reach adulthood, have certain amount of associations built up in their mind, their cogitative power. They're just, that's part of their training. They just associate some things with others. So part of it is, is you have to tear down those associations and then so that the person basically is open to any kind of association whatsoever. And then you introduce the various associations in the, in their mind. Now, the way this is very do often done is visually. So if people, if you, I'm sure many of you have seen those videos in which the, they will start where one newscaster says something and then he'll, re they'll repeat it, but then they add another person. And then over the course of time, your entire screen is filled with all of them saying the exact same thing. So what this means is, is that through the mainstream media, as well as in other forms of um, media, they are maintaining a constant perspective, a constant association, a constant way of looking at thing, things so that over the course of time, literally people's brains are stripped of their way of thinking and they actually start associating and thinking in a specific way. Okay. So the goal is to destroy clarity, especially about people's history about the reality of communism itself, about uh, virtually everything that has to do with their society. Their goal is to destroy clarity and the stability culturally through destroying the clarity. This is why they keep up the constant attacks. And in the mainstream media, you know that a lot of things that they're saying simply isn't true but you don't necessarily know what the truth actually is. And so you have to spend a lot of time trying to find information. So they, and a lot of this is because of the fact that they lie chronically. And even in alternative sources of information, you have to wade through a lot of that too, because despite the fact that many of them might be well-intentioned, a lot of times they don't have the facts right. So very often, especially in communist countries, and also countries in which the communists are trying to take over because the propaganda machine is basically controlled by the communists. It's very, very difficult to get to the truth, much like it's difficult when demons are attacking you because of this constant perspective they're putting on it to gain clarity about the truth of a situation. So the communists do the same thing, making it almost impossible to arrive at the truth in many instances. So what do you do? Well, it's the same thing that you do in relationships with demons. You get away from it. 
You get away from the mainstream media. You get away from the, the mechanism of propaganda to let your head clear and settle. And then you can take your time going back and looking at different, uh, sources of information to actually get the actual sources of information. You know, so like if they're claiming that such and such happened, go actually read the police report, go actually read what the UN said, go actually read what these things say, so that you actually know the truth about these things, both good and bad. And so in that particular way, you actually come to arrive at more the knowledge of the truth. There also has to be a certain kind of detachment from actually gaining clarity immediately. You have to be willing to kind of put things aside a little bit in order to pursue the knowledge that's necessary. And that comes in two ways, not just, not just finding the information out from various news sources, but you people also have to have a certain amount of intellectual knowledge, a certain amount of scientific knowledge, both philosophically, theologically, and also in the empirical sciences in order to sort through the things that are being said. So it's not just enough to read, you know, the, the, a particular source that you happen to like. You need to know these things independently of that so that when you go to judge the truth of these matters, you will have clarity. One of the mechanisms that you actually see in relationship to diabolic influence is what's called diabolic obsession. And in diabolic obsession, the attack is greater than it is in temptation. It's much stronger and it's very consistent. This should not be uh, confused with uh, psychological obsession because there is a legitimate form of psychological obsession, which is essentially consists of a set of bad mental habits um, in which the habits have become so strong that the person has, loses a great deal of control over their own thought process. But demons can actually obsess people. And if you get the demons out of the person's hair, then the person can actually think clearly and not obsess about the particular things that the demons are trying to do it. But in the obsession, the demons are trying to control the thoughts of the individual by constantly putting images in the person's imagination, by it being constant. And also the emotional manipulation becomes constant, where there's this constant reminder of what he wants you to think about, how he wants you to look at it. And the goal is to gain greater and greater control over you. As many exorcists say, the, they usually start out with diabolical oppression, where they attack people from the outside, so that the person starts just naturally obsessing about it. And then that opens the door because we shouldn't be obsessing about these things. We should just have trust in God. And so that disordered obsessing about the thing then opens the door to the demons driving the obsession. And then eventually as we, the, the person's thinking patterns become so imbued with diabolic influence that they end up uh, being suggested by the demons is the demons suggest something that the person does, which then is, opens up the door to, once the person does it, opens up the door to possession. That's their goal is possession. Okay, so there's this constant reminders. The battle is incessant. You can't seem to get away from it. Okay, communists do the same thing. Communists do this by the constant reminders in the news media, in various ways. There's things that you, everywhere you look, they're trying to put this in your mind. You see this right now in relationship to the riots, the protests, it's constantly in the news media. It is just literally constant. What's so ironic is, is that it's actually the news media and the communists that are actually obsessing about this stuff. But that all being said, they are putting this thing as constant reminders so when you look at, for example, the images or video of communist countries, you will very often notice that they will have constant reminders in various locations all throughout the country about who's in charge. For example, in Nazi Germany, it was the swastika. You Everywhere you looked, you practically saw it, or you'd see the image of the leader. You see this in certain communist countries today where everywhere you look, there's an image of the leader. It's constant reminder to you of who's in control. It's a constant reminder of that you are not independent of the government. They are going to be in control of you. You actually see this today in relationship to certain reminders, not just relationship to the riots and things like that, but you see it in relationship to COVID and the various things that they want you to do in relationship with COVID. It's constant. The media 
all have the exact same talking points. As I mentioned in the last video, you can watch 40 of them and they will all literally say the exact same thing, literally almost timed so perfectly together that you wonder how they actually are capable of even doing that. This is also in the news media while you will hear the exact same stories from virtually all the outlets. The information that we really need to know or the true information is being hidden to us. And so this is how they actually control the sources of information. So just if you, if you want to know whether you're being manipulated by communists or Marxists in some particular aspect of our country, simply look at something if there is a constant reminder, if if they're asking you to wear something, if they're asking you, because that's what they used to do with the people in the concentration camps, they had to wear certain things as a constant reminder to them. If they're asking you to constantly wear something or constantly do something or constantly think something, then you know they are that you are that they are trying to manipulate you. The communists in that country are trying to manipulate you and to control you. Christ labeled Satan as the father of lies, and he made observation that he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. The fact that he is the father of lies tells you something. When the demons were created. They were actually created in a state of innocence. They were angels created in a state of innocence with sanctifying grace. They were actually pleasing to God in their first instance. And in that first instance, they were given a knowledge of who they are, who God was, what God was asking them as to their divinely assigned task, etc. The second instance, they made a choice whether they were going to follow that or not. And then St. Thomas Aquinas says, in their third instance, they were then either damned or rewarded. So there was, it was all very quick. And that's why when Satan made his decision in the second instance of his existence, he made a decision not to follow the will of God. And he chose a lie. And he basically lied also to the other demons about what he would promise them and things of that sort. That second instance, he, the fact is his will became fixed. All angels, their wills became fixed either in the good in choosing to do God's will or in falsity in choosing not to do God's will. And so, or in evil in choosing not to do God's will. As a result of that, Satan became the father of lies insofar as demons chronically lie. He lies. In fact, one of the lines that my father once said to me, he said, look, there's certain people that will lie even when the truth sounds better. And this is a perfect description of demons. They lie even when the truth sounds better. You'd see this even in session. They will chronically lie even when it would go better for them. Their suffering would be less if they simply told the truth. They still lie anyway. And it's because of the fact that their wills are fixed in the falsehood. And the only time they really tell the truth is if they can gain something from it or if they're under duress, that is being punished by an exorcist or God in order to force to tell the truth. So their wills are fixed in, e in evil. That doesn't mean that they don't know the truth. They know the truth intellectually because their intellects can't be in error because their knowledge is infused by God. Unlike human beings, we receive all our knowledge through our senses and derive conceptual knowledge through experience and things of that sort. They don't go through that. It was all infused in the beginning. So they know the truth. But they cannot but lie because their will is now fixed in falsity. Some of it is for the sake of manipulation and control. A lot of times they just lie because they're trying to manipulate and control you. But this tells you, therefore, that when they don't tell you the truth, I kind of mentioned this a little bit in the last video. Once we know the truth about something, then we're free to make a full choice in relationship to it. If we don't, we're basically being held bondage by whoever is telling us the lie. This is why Christ said the truth will set us free. You actually even see that in some cases of possession where the possession is light. Once the person comes to knowledge of 
the, the truth about a particular thing that the demon was lying to them about or putting false images in their imagination. Once they come to the truth, the demon's power over them is broken. And so as a result of that, their slavery to the demon is broken as well in that regard. Communists do the same thing. Communists lie as a means of control. They lie chronically. You see this even on the mainstream news media where they'll interview people and they're just literally constantly lying. And you're, it's, it's a bit mind blowing actually. But the point being is they lie as a means of control. They'll only tell you the truth, much like demons. Demons will tell you the truth if they can get something from it. Communists will tell you the truth if it's going to benefit. Otherwise, they simply lie in order to control you. They lie even when everyone else knows the truth. They'll, they'll get up there. Everybody knows in a particular instance that X did not happen. And yet they'll continue constantly pushing the narrative, even though it's been proven clearly over and over again, it didn't happen. They continually tell a lie in relationship to it, um, even though they know everyone else knows the truth. It's because they ultimately want to enslave, control, and manipulate. Communism purports, and Marxism purports, to end up in this utopia where Private property is abolished, and every and as a result of that, everybody will be on an equal plane. And once that happens, everything will be hunky dory. The fact of the matter is, is that's just completely false. Every single communist system has always ended up in the subjects of the communists being enslaved, controlled, manipulated, put to death, etc. It has never ended in this is in socialism. It's the same thing in the sense that socialism is a stepping stone to communism, but it also ends up in people not having the basic necessities of life. They just tell everybody, Oh, if we go with this socialist thing or that history has shown over and over again, it doesn't work. So even when everybody knows the truth, they still keep telling the lie because they know deep down that human beings want a better life and hearing Utopic ideas is an appeal to a human desire, when in point in fact human beings have to be serious, they have to be objective and realize that's just not the reality of the situation. When an exorcist does sessions in which exorcisms are done, to compel the demons to give information in order to arrive at what is necessary in order to get them out. One of the things that the exorcist will observe is that when demons are caught in a lie or a crime of some sort, instead of humbly apologizing and asking for forgiveness, they spin the they make some type of excuse, they spin the they spin what is understood as the truth of the matter to make themselves look good. They never admit fault. They blame others. Um, they very often will blame the possessed person or innocent people, etc. They create a diversion to mitigate the damage. You name it. Everything is done in order to deflect the blame and the culpability. Part of this is because of the demons, the fact that the demons have no humility because their sin was rooted in pride ultimately. And so they will never apologize or ask for forgiveness except under great duress in session. And even then, they won't mean it. They'll just go through the motions of it. Communists do the exact same thing. You notice that when they do something bad or communism fails in some way, they enter into the, the blame game. They blame this person or that person or this group of people or for that particular individual, etc. for their failure or they're the thing that they did wrong. They never admit fault, even when everybody in the room can see it and knows it, that it's them. They're the ones who have to, they just won't admit it. They create diversions. This is why politicians have been doing this for some time. You know, something comes up and then the next thing you know, a building gets blown up. Um, you know, some particular congressman or president gets caught in something, the next thing you know, there's a bombing somewhere, etc. And the media is complicit in this. They know that. They know that that's what's actually going on. The communists will also label things contrary to reality to mitigate their own fault. 
error or evil or to hide their own agenda. Demons just do the same thing. They're, they label stuff so that it makes it look not as bad as it is or it makes it look good when in point in fact it's actually bad for people. They will create false flags. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but as part of their, uh, as part of their modus operandi, is they don't let any crisis go to waste. Demons will create a crisis and then blame the possessed. We'll see that a little bit more later. And so do the communists. It's all done to gain control over the individual. As in the cases of demons, it is ultimately done just to mitigate any possible loss of power that they might have by being seen as culpable for something that they have done which is wrong. We see this also in relationship to not just individuals, that is the power that the demons have over individuals, but even over societies or nations, that demons will do the same thing. But it's also true even in relationship to communists. Communists do the same thing. It's ultimately to divert the situation, to divert people's perceptions, to divert the blame and the culpability so that they will not lose power or control or be seen as weak or whatever the case is. This is why it's all part of the lie as well. But this is a different aspect to it. They simply won't accept blame. It has been said that the great achievement of Satan in the modern world is to get people to think that he does not exist. And that is indeed true. Even if people do believe he exists, they don't believe he's involved in people's lives or things of this sort. A lot of people don't even believe that hell exists. This is done. So Satan has pulled this off. This, he did this to, in order to infiltrate this, a, the various areas of human lives that in the past he would have simply been booted out. Now we're going to talk about infiltration in, later in the series. But this is something that is, it's done in order to hide so that they can spread, uh, spread their influence. This is why demons do it. Communists will simply deny the existence of communism when, or they'll deny that their agenda is communistic in nature or that the party that they belong to is communist, when in point in fact it is communist. So in that particular case, they're just like the demons in which they're trying to hide their existence in some way. They deny one is a communist, even though they know that that is what one is promoting. In other words, they know that they're promoting communism, but they'll deny that it's communism or it's this or it's that because communism has a negative connotation. Socialism has changed in its connotation. In the past, at least in the United States, it had a negative connotation, but now it's become uh, has a positive connotation, but this is because of the formation that the communists did of people in the public education and in the colleges. That's where that's come from, as everybody knows. The word communism is never even used when they promote this stuff. If it is used, it is never used by those who are part of it. This is all a way to remain hidden. In other words, that is one of the signs of communism. Like Satan, he always presents something as good, but his real ulterior motive is to destroy or to hurt the people or to get them to commit sin. It's the same thing in relationship to communism. They label it something else to get you to sign off on it, when in point, in fact, what you're signing off in is not that at all. They are masters at selling people a bill of goods. Demons hide or obfuscate. That is, they hide so that you can't see them, or they obfuscate, that is, they confuse things so that it's hard to discern what's them and what's not them. And this is all done in order to deceive, so that you don't really know who they are. In other words, it's shifting around all the time, so it's hard to determine what's them and what's not them. It's, they shift tactics all the time, too, in order to engage in the warfare so that it's hard to combat them because they're constantly shifting around and changing. Granted, the demons are phenomenally consistent, but to human beings, they seem almost random, or it's hard to know 
what's them and what's not them. Historically, it has been said by many theologians that the demons take the same old errors that they purport, that they pushed in the early church and things like that, and they call them something new and then propagate them all over again. We're seeing that in spades, especially in the church, but we also see that even in the political sphere, you're starting to see that more and more. Communists call themselves all sorts of things other than communists. Bella Dodd mentions this in her book, The School of Darkness, where essentially what they do is they will rebrand themselves or label themselves something other than communism. When you figure them out, that is, once a per, once culture figures out, hey, wait a minute, these people are just a bunch of communists and Marxists, they rebrand. They'll call themselves, so she mentioned that, you know, you go from communism and then it was to socialism and now it's called progressivism. And so basically anyone who's a progressivist is basically just a communist, at least in the, in the context in which she was discussing it. And so they tend to push the same old stuff just under a different name or by varying degrees. Socialism, as I mentioned, is just simply a stepping stone. Once you get that property or ownership of things out of the hands of the people into the hands of the government, it's just a stepping stone to communism, which is where nobody owns anything. They rebrand themselves, but they remain the same. There's nothing new under the sun in relationship to communists and to communism. It's still the same old thing. As a matter of joke, but there is a certain truth in it. It is said that it is a sign of insanity when a person does the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Communism is a perfect example of that. Socialism is a perfect example of that. Every place it's been tried, they, it, it has been an unmitigated disaster. People will say, oh, well, if we just did this differently or just did that differently, but it's the same thing. So trying it again here in the United States is just going to end up in the same situation as it is in other countries where communism was done. People rebrand things and do so in a manner that looks completely different. Or they say they're going to rebrand something or they say they're going to do something different. When in point, in fact, it's just the same thing. They will use words that have a positive connotation because they know human psychology well enough to know that if you simply use communism, then people are going to think that, uh, you know, that in point, that you're just going to think that, oh, well, this is bad because communism has a negative connotation. In fact, it's gotten to the point where if somebody even mentions communism, I'm sure it's going to end up in one of the uh, comments in, in, in these videos that people are, you know, that think that I am, uh, you know, that I'm obsessing about communism. Actually, that's not true. This is the first series that I've ever done on communism, and the only reason I'm really doing it is because of the fact that it's it's bad in our culture. But it's gotten to the point where even to mention that something is communistic has become almost labeled a conspiracy theory. It's almost on that level, like, oh, here we go, you know, it's the it's the McCarthy and the House of Un-American Activities kind of level thing, you know, that kind of uh, approach. And so... It's hard to even label stuff as communism because people don't want it or even label it as Marxist because people don't want it. Although Marxism has, because of all the formation of people in the school systems and in the education system, especially in colleges, has taken on a positive connotation these days when in point in fact, there is nothing positive about it. So this is something to keep in mind. They might put a positive spin on it, but in the end, it's the same old communism. There is a great book written by Joseph Pieper called Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power. And basically in there, he talks about the fact that when one abuses language, that is, modifies the meanings of terms and things of that while everyone else is working off those old meanings, that there's an abuse that occurs and it's ultimately to manipulate and control people. You see this in relationship to demons. They abuse language all the time. They'll use a term and you're just like, yeah, yes, that's not exactly what that term means. Or they will say things and you're just like, yeah, well, that's not exactly what the reality of what's going on here. Demons abuse notions, concepts, and language. They change these. They, they will put something in people's minds in order to 
switch or to modify how they view the particular thing. And as a result of that, they can get people to sign off on error. An example would be very often during possession cases, the demon will get to the point where he's not particularly happy that he's taking a bad beating in the sessions. And so he will say, he will make a claim that he has a right to the individual. Now, sometimes the person has uh, committed a mortal sin, that is a grave sin, and as a result, opened the door, and so the demon's got his foot in the door. But that doesn't mean they have a right. They have permission from Christ to be there, not a right. If they had, and the reason they're using the term right is because they know that if they have a right, then they have a moral claim to the individual, and we don't have a right to be, or we should not be doing applying power of Christ against them to boot them out. They use the term right in order to sow confusion. They do it in order to make the person feel like there's nothing they can do because they just simply have to, you know, accept the fact that this demon is there and God's allowing it or that God, that they had the demon has a right and so they can't do anything about it and they just have to live with it. It's just all nonsense. The fact is, is that they are abusing the term right. And this is something that you see chronically going on even in our own culture. It's done in order to sow confusion and create an atmosphere where they can step in and to control or assert themselves as the solution to the problem. So we'll talk more and more about that as we go along. Demons can fake clarity in a person when he thinks he knows what is right and then he has it figured out, but he is completely disconnected from reality. I mentioned this mechanism a few videos back that people can actually think they have clarity when in point in fact they're completely off. You see this when people get angry. They think that the verbal abuse that they level out on the individual is proportionate to what the individual has done, and the demon will aggravate that and say, yeah, he deserves it, he deserves it. And then after the person's head clear, they realize, oh man, it was much more, I, I didn't, I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Communists abuse language simply by the rebranding, which we talked about in the last video. You know, they won't be honest. They won't be clear about what they think and what their agenda is. They won't tell people, we're going to strip you of everything you own and collectively take it, and which, by the way, in the end, only a few people end up with it. We're going to take all your property from you. We're going to take your means of living from you. We're going to take your household, everything that you own, etc. They won't admit that. Rather, but they rebrand it as, you know, we're going to do this for the rights of the workers and things of that sort. They don't even have a clue what the rights of the workers even are. The rights of the workers are to have the right to own the property, which is the product of their labor, but they don't want to do that. They label their opponents things that are not truly applicable to their opponents. We see this going on. Historically, communists have always argued that they are the people, they are for the people, but in the end, they do absolutely nothing for the people. They argue that they are trying to free the people from oppression of capitalism, when in the end, they are simply trying to enslave people. In fact, when they tell you they're going to do something, you should invert it. It's called diabolic inversion. Demons, when a demon says X, Y, and Z is the case, actually, then you say X, Y, and Z is not the case. That's usually what it is in relationship to demons because they lie all the time. It's the same thing with communists. Invert what they say, and that's actually what's going to happen. When they say they're for, you know, this particular ethnic group or that or this, it probably tells you that they're just using that ethnic group in order to advance them. So they can treat those, treat that ethnic group as if they're cattle or slaves. Today, they are calling people things like racists, which they aren't. They're calling people misogynists, and this is just a tactic or a ploy to put people on the defensive. It doesn't matter to them whether, whether they believe it or not. The only thing is, is that they want you to believe it so that they can use it to manipulate you. The sad part is that when something is truly racist or misogynist, and this is the real problem, they abuse the language so that when real instances of racism or misogyny or things of this occur, it gets ignored. And because people are just, people have gotten to the point where the term racist doesn't mean anything anymore because it's bantered about all the time so that when it actually does occur, when racism actually does occur, either you know, from one race to another, and it does, every, every race is capable of committing racism against any other race. This is one thing we learned about human fallen human nature. It gets ignored. 
And why? Because if you cry wolf all the time, eventually when the term wolf is cried, people just stop paying attention to it. It too often results in simply people ignoring true cases of racism and misogyny. In the end, communism and the communists and the Marxists, especially in the United States, by this constant talking about it and fomenting it, in the end, it's simply going to lead to more racism and misogyny and disordered and illicit discrimination. We now come to the second part in our discussion of the similarities between demons, that is, spiritual warfare and communism. In the first part, we talked about the epistemological aspects of how communism and Satan function. In this part, we will discuss how demons and communists relate to each to other people and the guiding principles for those relationships, how they view the, Sometimes people will look at the communists and they can't believe they're, they're appalled by their behavior, but they're, they're operating under very distinctive principles. They do not approach relations under the same aspect of the virtue of affability like everybody else's. They're not interested in just getting along. You know, can't we all get along? No, they can't do take that approach. They might tell you that initially in order to get you to soften towards them, but in the end, they don't approach relationships in the sense of looking for mutual relationships, cooperations, etc. They're only interested in whether you're going to do their bidding. Okay, so to the first part of this, or to the first segment of this part, demons have no ability to love. Once they chose evil, that meant that the definition of willing the good of, the, of another would never play a part in their lives because they were incapable of willing the good for another. And so they simply do not love other people or demons. They have no ability to love or to look out for the good of another person per se. By that, I mean in the sense, but only parochians. What does that mean? Well, that's a philosophical distinction between in and of itself, they're not capable really of loving people, but they might look out for somebody or they might give somebody good if they can uh, gain something from it. In other words, they can only do the good for someone if they think they're going to get something out of it. That's the way demons function. Their ultimate goal, even when they're doing good for people under certain aspects, for example, when the people who engage in witchcraft, they, or even Satanism, find it interesting that the demons, or find it delightful that the demons are giving them certain things, but in point in fact, the demons are only doing that to enslave them and to empower them. Their ultimate goal is the person's destruction, loss of life, and above all, the loss of his soul. Communists are not about building up the common good or the good of others, but in fomenting class struggles as well as various other kinds of struggles, in order to bring about the conditions of revolution, this is straight from their own literature, so that they can seize power. That is, ultimately, it's about themselves. Neither demons nor communists seek the good of the individual, because if they did, they would work together with others, support the good of the other, and, and so on. But they simply don't. Others are seen as a means to an end for demons and also for communists. From that, it follows that it is perfectly acceptable to manipulate them to get what you want. In other words, once you see people as a means to an end, then you just manipulate them. They're like cattle or they're like animals. You just manipulate them in order to get what you want. For demons, it is a case of humans are a means to their vindication against God. They have an absolute hatred for God because he asked them to do something that they rejected, that they didn't want to do. That is... They delight in control and destruction of human beings to get back at God. And also as a form of envy, they don't want us to have anything good because they don't have anything good. For communists, humans are means to bring about their utopia or vision of a capital-free and owner-free society, ownership-free society. They delight in controlling and manipulating others, and they have no problem in bringing about destruction 
which we'll bring that up more later as the series goes along. They have no problem in causing mass destruction in order to bring about what they want. The communists to these ends, we see Saul Alinsky, who was uh, basically a person who trained thugs. That's basically, if you look at it, he learned from the mafia how to do certain things, and then he turned around and trained other people to do, to basically, in thuggery, to be thugs. In his rules for radicals, the first rule is power is not only what you have, but what your enemy thinks you have. With demons, they often will say things in order for you to think that their power is greater than it is, uh, or that they are stronger than they actually are. You see this all the time. The first time that an exorcist gets a demon to actually mention what his name is, to say what his name is, he'll say, I'm Satan. Well, you know, as some exorcists say, I, I've seen Satan and you ain't him. So the point being is, is that they'll often make it seem bigger than they actually are so that the, so that the priest or exorcist or whoever or even the possessed will think, uh oh, this is going to be really hard and difficult when often it's uh, pretty easy. Or another thing they'll say is, I am legion. And in all the cases I've ever had, I've only had one case where I, act, where I actually thought there was legion. In the rest of the cases, whenever they would say that, you know they're lying. It's just a bluff in order to get you to think that they're more powerful than they actually are. And this is what Saul Alinsky is basically tapping into, is that psychology of perception. It's about perception management. They want to, to manage how you perceive them so that they can give you the impression that they're actually stronger than they are when, in point in fact, they're very weak. Communists will often lie about public support for their movements. The media will take clips in which the angles look like there's large numbers of people at rallies or at, um, at protests when there's only just a few people such as in political events and demonstrations and even in riots. Inversely, they will try to convince their enemies that they are powerless. You can't do anything. We're here. We've got the power. you got nothing. In relation to demons, this is true. Only Christ acting through us is power actually applied to the demons. We are powerless. As he said, without us, without me, you can do nothing. So, whereas... With him, we can do all things. And so we are powerless, but Christ isn't. And in relationship to the demons, we can apply the power of Christ when Christ gives it to us under certain circumstances in order to drive the demons out. Demons are cowards and actually every, and actually very weak. They're very, very weak. It's just that they are great at portraying it. It's true that in their will, they're stronger than humans because they're they're higher in the hierarchy of being, but their weakness is their sin. And that's a key point. Communists are also coward, except in groups. Their weakness is in reality, that is, not in people's perception of them, which is often false, but in the reality that a majority virtually never support their views or agendas. They constantly try and make everybody think that, that you know, that there's more of them than they actually are. When people think they are strong, they won't fight them. They'll acquiesce. They give in to their demands. They won't confront them. This is something that you're actually a phenomenon you're seeing in our culture. People feel like they can't speak out about what they believe politically because they're afraid of being verbally bludgeoned by a leftist, which is just another name for a communist. But in reality, both demons and communists are weak. And this is why we should never refrain from confronting them, prudence being observed. Demons know that human beings have a natural law inclination to live in accord with the law of God. They know that. God structured into our intellects and into our very being an inclination to want to obey him and to live according to the laws as he has determined it. So demons will either harangue the person for not living perfectly according to the laws in order to wound the person. That is, they'll tell them you're bad, you're, you, should, you should have done this, you should have done that, or, you know, God's law says this, you were supposed to be doing that, etc. Or they make him feel bad about not living up to perfection. And this is done to weaken him so that he is easier to control. Or demons will take 
legitimate rules and bend them slightly and then harangue the person for not following the rules, you know. So, uh, you know, and, and you'll see this from time to time, even in relationship to the people who are possessed. They, they go through this where they a lot of times don't have clarity about what God's law actually is, even if they've been taught it. But demons are constantly trying to get the person to go against God's law, ultimately. Demons themselves did not obey God's laws. They chose something contrary to it. In other words, unless God makes them do something, they are lawless and lack any rules except the rule of power. That's the only rule that really they follow. So a lower demon will do whatever the upper demon tells him to do just because he doesn't want to deal with the uh, the opprobrium that he's going to rain down on him. Saul Alinsky, in his Rules for Radicals, in rule number four, says, make the enemy live up to his own book of rules. But what is not said is that the radical communist follows no rules. They follow only, the only rule that they follow is, is that the seizing of power for the sake of bringing about this utopia, or so it seems. I'm not convinced that almost all the communists uh, that have seized power actually did it for pure motives. I think a, a majority of them actually did it because it was a means by which they could uh, bludgeon their opposition and gain power and money. So the only rule that they follow ultimately is what empowers them. This is why they do not obey the laws of any country. This, this is the thing that frustrates so many Americans, is the fact that we have seen politicians and public uh, figures and people in the media and in Hollywood, you know, flagrantly violating the law. Everybody knows they've been violating the law and nothing is done about it. This is why they don't obey the laws in any country, except when except those which they have power over. That's the only time they're really going to try and follow the law or enforce the law. They're treasonous because only their power is important to them. The country isn't important to them. The United States isn't important to the communists or the Marxists that are now rioting and carrying on. They're, they're not interested in the United States. In fact, they even admit as much that they want to destroy the United States as it is. They do not follow basic society or human rules. In other words, they don't have any basic decency. This is one of the things that you actually see with them. So, in the end, one of the ways that you can identify a communist is someone who doesn't follow any real rules. And even the rules they make for other people, they don't follow themselves. The term devil means the accuser or slanderer. It's the one that stands and accuses somebody of wrongdoing, whether perceived or real. Demons constantly accuse those that they possess. They're constantly haranguing them, you're evil, you're evil, God doesn't love you because I'm here, and etc. When in point in fact, God is using the possession to sanctify the individual or help the individual through and to become closer to him so that in the end it's actually a sign that god wants to draw the person closer to him demons also accuse the when they obsess people just constantly making the person feel bad about things or tempt things which are often false you know a person will very often appropriate certain thoughts to themselves like what kind of an individual would think such a thing when in point in fact it's not even from them it's from it's from the devil accusation is done in order to place the person on the defensive. That's why you do it. You, you accuse him so that he has to defend himself. That is, and it's, it places the person in a position of weakness. This is the goal. This is why demons do it. They accuse you so you feel bad about yourself, and then not only do you have to deal with your own feeling bad about yourself, but then you also have to deal with him and his haranguing. It's to multiply the fronts in the spiritual warfare. It is done to destroy the person's self-image. The image they think other people have of them, as well as the person's very reputation. Demons never accuse the guilty, because they already have them under their control. Unless the guilty are trying to straighten their life out, then they might try it. But generally speaking, they don't accuse those who are guilty because they already have them under their control, as sin places them under their control. Demons will often accuse the possessed of the thing that the demon himself is guilty of. That's one of the signs that, you know, that 
there's diabolic influences and the, 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 the accusation comes from a demon. You see this people who are possessed. If they're possessed and all of a sudden the demon starts telling them they're this, that, and the other thing, he's not going to tell them the truth. He's going to lie to them. He's going to accuse them of stuff that's simply not true. Communists accuse others of what they themselves are guilty of. They themselves are guilty of causing harm to other people or not being out for other people's well-being. They themselves are guilty of, you know, sedition and all sorts of other things or things in which they, you know, try and cause harm or out for their own power, their own good, or that they're, they're just little tired, you know, they'll accuse others of being tyrants when they themselves actually are. In fact, one of the signs of communis communism is they'll demand that there's all sorts of democracy until they get in positions of control and then they just become dictatorial. They even accuse others of accusing you of what they are guilty. This is a chronic problem among politics that subscribe to communist and Marxist ideology. And you can see it just by turning on the television. One aspect of diabolical oppression is the destruction of people's reputations. Diabolical oppression is, occurs when demons attack people from the outside in their finances, their possessions, their property, their relationships, etc. And so this is one of the areas that they, demons can, God permitting, um, attack the individual. And so one of the areas that they try to do it is by destroying people's reputation. And the way they do that is by jading people's perspective on the person's behavior or on the person himself. So that in the end, people start thinking negatively of the individual and thus the destruction of their reputation. This is ultimately done to isolate them so that they can't uh, gain help or get help for the problems that they struggle in relationship to the diabolic attacks. Communists essentially do the same thing. They impugn the person's reputation. They try to destroy it in order to get p and they put all sorts of stuff out putting perspectives on the person's behavior constantly. You'll see this, you know, the communists will say that this particular politician or that politician did X, Y, and Z when in point in fact he didn't, or that he did X, Y, and Z for such and such a motive or etc. And so they do all of this and constantly in order to jade people's perspective, in order to destroy his reputation so that he will be weakened and isolated. And as a result of that, they have essentially removed him of from their enemy list because he now got booted out and so people don't pay any attention to him so then they can move on to the next one. So that's one of the things that communists do. They impugn their opponent's reputation even if he's not guilty of anything, of any crime or any sin. One of the hallmarks of the diabolic is the persecution of people who are innocent. Now they persecute people who are innocent because those people are in, in the innocence, or they are in the image of God in a very, and they themselves are not innocent. And looking at someone who's innocent is a constant reminder to them of their own sin. So they may feel guilty around the person. So they, they attack him and they attack the innocent person in a variety of ways. One of them is attacking the innocent person are accusing him of things that they are not even guilty of. They just accuse the person of it, you know, accusing him of committing this or that sin or crime or what have you. They'll also move or incite others to attack them, that is, the, the innocent. Demons can affect people's perception, and as a result, they can draw people to be critical or even harming, harmful to the individual thinking that they're actually doing a good thing. You see this among communists in their movements. They get people who are not, don't have a high, high degree of depth of thought. They get sucked in by drinking their Kool-Aid, so to speak, by drinking their platitudes and things of that sort. And so they actually think that people who stand in the opposition to that are evil. And so they'll actually go out and harm them, not realizing what they're actually doing. Demons persecute the innocents because the innocents remind them of their own guilt, as I mentioned. They persecute the innocent because they hate what they stand for, that is, the law of God. An innocent person is someone who is obedient to the law of God. Demons persecute the innocent just as a general attacks the strongest of the cities first. In other words, when you're going in to take out your enemy, 
You might have to do a little bit in the initial stages to take out some small stuff, but in the end, you have to take out the, the primary city that, or the primary fortress that the enemy is occupying. Once you take that out, then everything else will fall. Once you get the main city, then all the other cities will fold. That's the understanding of it. Or sometimes you might have to work up your way to the largest city, such as in the, or the stronghold, such as what happened in the Second World War and trying to take Berlin. But the point being, but that only had to do with geographics. In the end, you need, your enemy isn't vanquished until you take his strongest city. And this is one of the reasons why the demons don't feel that they have vanquished God or they've vanquished those who stand for God until they take out the innocent. Communists persecute the innocent and free the guilty. We see this going on all the time on the mainstream news media right now. Someone will come up and make a statement and they will completely malign the individual. The person might have been doing their job and they say that he is a racist or he's this or he's that. And in the meantime, those very communists are passing laws to let people who are guilty of true crimes out without bail or things of this sort. So they free the guilty. This is done because they are basically brigands. They're thugs who love chaos. That's basically what it boils down to. This is done to cause further division, which we're going to discuss more later. In other words, by letting these people out, those people are going to go commit more crimes, and then that creates more dissension and and also dis difficulties within the society. This is done to weaken the, weaken the rule of law and societal order. The guilty often perpetrate crimes again, and that's exactly why they're let out. They hate the innocent or good citizens because they stand in their way to total power. They hate the average guy in the street who's a law-abiding citizen, and the reason they hate him is because they know that they cannot perpetrate their crime, they cannot take over their country until they basically take those kinds of people out or at least silence them in some manner. This is why they are all for the First Amendment for themselves and for those who push their agenda but refuse to allow it to those who speak in opposition. They hate the innocent because they are in the image of God and Christ. And that is the communists, not just the demons, the communists. They hate those things that are in the image of God and the image of Christ because they are essentially godless and atheistic. And we know that from the very writings of Marx himself. In one of the prior videos, we had mentioned the fact that during sessions, demons will often look for excuses. You know, when you say, hey, this is what you're doing, knock it off. They'll try and blame one of the other demons or they'll, they're constantly trying to divert blame for what they have done. Even when you call them on the carpet for their behavior, they will accuse you of doing it or having false motives. You're only saying this because of X, Y, and Z. In other words, demons will very often cause an emotional response in relationship to the person who's possessed or whatever the case in order to accuse you of that so that they can accuse you of false motives. And the reason they do that is to so that you will begin to question yourself or stop the attack on them so that you can address this issue within yourself. It's all a diversionary tactic to take it off from them so they can continue doing what they're doing. Communists do the same thing. When communists are caught in bad behavior, law-breaking or destruction of property, society, and people's lives, they'll never admit it, which we've talked about. They distract from their guilt by casting aspersions elsewhere or accusing their opponent who points out their guilt, that he's only doing this for false motives. This is one of the things that you actually see, basically saying that this person's intentions are evil. In other words, it's all about imp imputing false motive to those who do the good. It should not be tolerated. They should, uh, once the person says, this is the reason I'm doing it, they expect you to take it on face value, then we should demand that they take it on face value. In the Summa Theologia of St. Thomas Aquinas, in the Secunda Secunda, which is the second part of the second part, question 75, we, we read about the sin of derision. So, derision is derived from the word resence, which from which we get the term ridicule. 
it's considered a sin in which through speech or laughter, we seek to shame someone else. In other words, we deride people in order to shame them, to lower them in other people's view. You see this, communists actually have, we, there's actually videos on YouTube about how the communists in China used to publicly shame people, publicly shame them. In, or, and this was all done in order to weaken their, uh, their opposition and to make it look bad. And this is, and you see this even in the mainstream media. They'll laugh at people, uh, when in point, in fact, it's just a form of ridicule in order to deride them. Saul Alinsky, in his book, Rules for Radicals, rule number five, says, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. In other words, you get people to ridicule some, you ridicule someone else so that other people will laugh at him. And in that process, the, their view of the person has been diminished and the person, and it becomes delightful to see the other person's perceived disorder or perceived problem. Demons will ridicule the exorcist. They do this from time to time. The possessed, they ridicule them as well. They will often incite someone to do something, then ridicule them for being so stupid and gullible. So in other words, they'll get a person to fall and then they'll just laugh at them and talk about how stupid they are. Demons ridicule each other. That is, the, de the up higher demons will ridicule the demons below them. Other demons will ridicule and laugh at the other demons, but not in their presence, in the sense of not when they're paying attention to each other. It's only behind their back. Communists seek to shame others and will use laughter or comedy in a condescending manner about the defect, either real or imagined, of another. This is commonly seen in Hollywood right now. You see it in stand-up comedy. You see it, uh, you know, it, all over the place in the news media. It is ulti ultimately done to lower the individual and in the perceptions of others. So, in the past, ridicule was considered not part of polite society. Why? Well, because the church at least considered it sin is, is sinful. And nobody likes to be the object of ridicule. But this is one of the signs that you're dealing with a communist is that he will try to demean people publicly or in the eyes of others. And not everybody who does that is a communist, but communists regularly try to demean or shame people in the eyes of others through ridicule. We observed that demons and communists, but demons will accuse a person of doing good things for a wrong motive. So even when someone does something good, they want to make sure that it it doesn't be perceived as good. Or for actually doing something bad, that is, they'll they'll claim that the person has done something bad or they've done it for the wrong motives. And this is because the uh the good um that they actually did will cause damage to the demons. In other words, the reason the demons criticize the good is A, they don't want the person to become powerful in relationship to them, and also recognize the fact that God is working through them, and so they are becoming powerful in relationship to the demons. That is God, again, working through them. They don't want them to recognize that. So they continually accuse the person, even when they have done something good, in order to afflict the person's self-perception, uh, or to weaken them to some degree. So that's what they want to do. It's all about weakening their opponent. They will sometimes... In cases of oppression, make sure that the good person does it, uh, but the good that the person does is perceived badly by others, right? So demons can affect other people's perceptions of the good that we do, and that's how that they can cause, uh, the destruction of people's reputation. We've talked about this already in this, in this series. Communists have a general principle. If your opponent does something good, criticize it anyway so that it affects people's perceptions of him. You never want to let your opponent be perceived as good by others, because as soon as you do that, once you attack him, it makes you look bad. If he does the good, it must be cast in a negative light. Just as with demons, the attitude the communists have is that if one of if one's opponent is viewed as good, it will detract from people's perception of you. 
In other words, St. Thomas says that some people don't like other people receiving the good or being perceived as good because then it takes away from how people view them. It lowers people's view of them in their eyes. And so the good name and reputation of the individual must be attacked at all costs. And one of the ways that you know you're dealing with a communist organization, a communist propaganda machine, is that the attack on the person's good reputation, just like it is with demons who constantly attack, you know you're dealing with a communist propaganda machine when the attack on a particular person's reputation is incessant. One of the characteristics that you will see of demons is that they are extraordinarily vindictive. Even when they take a beating for something that they legitimately should take a beating for, they cannot but help to want to and actually try and meet out against the person who's administered divine justice to them. They want to meet out against him all sorts of evil and difficulty. And this is because they take everything personally. That's something to remember about demons. Because in their sin, they chose something they wanted, They their will became fixed and revolves around themselves rather than God. And be, as a result, they take everything personally. Their sin was about themselves, and so anyone who acts contrary to their activity or sin, they take it personally. They hate the person rather than just realizing, well, this person is just doing God's will. No, they hate the per individual for doing it. If they don't get what they want, or if they get shut down, they will take it out on an individual rather than accepting their humiliation. We mentioned that before. They won't. They have no humility. They won't take being put in their place, etc. Demons desire power, and when they don't get it in relationship to human beings, they get very vindictive. Communists, when opposition arises contrary to communism and their tactics, they become very vindictive in their attacks on the individual. It, become, it becomes just a, it, the vitriol becomes very strong. They will not tolerate being shut down when they are making their push to take things over to gain more power. When they get shut down, they also become very vindictive. That is, uh, Ultimately, they attack upon those who try to shut them down. Demons will very often, when they don't get what they want, in addition to becoming vindictive, is they will throw a little tantrum. They will, you know, once you, once it becomes clear that the person is slipping from their grip in the case of possession, that they're losing the control over the possession, some demons will literally start acting like they're three or four years of age. She's mine. She's mine. She's mine. You know, as, as if like, like a little child in relationship to a toy. Demons also will throw a tantrum whenever they're accused or anything like that. They just blow their lid. They can't, they cannot discuss things rationally or meanly without taking it personally. And this is something to keep in mind that when you're dealing with them, you have to be you have to be willing to accept two parts of the dynamic. One is that everything you say that contradicts what they say will be taken personally. Second, as a result of that, they're going to attack you. And this is something that we just have to keep in mind when we are dealing with communists. Human respect is a vice in which people overvalue or estimate other's opinion or view that others have of them. In other words, human respect is when a person will very often do certain things out of excess because they tend to want to have people think better of them or they want them to uh, view them in a good way and so they'll do things or overvalue what the other person thinks. St. Thomas Aquinas discusses in his various tracts, what he calls sinners. Now, sinners are people who have committed moral sin and are not in the state of grace. And he makes the observation that sinners are far more worried about the exterior man than the interior man. What does that mean? It means that they're more worried about their appearance, their physical appearance, how they look, things of that sort, how they're viewed by other people, than they are their actual spiritual state or well-being. And as a result, he says, sinners suffer from human respect. 
demons in session demonstrate the psychology of sinners in that regard to a T. They're very sensitive about wanting to be perceived as good or justified in what they did or okay or whatever the case is when, in point in fact, they're just evil, right? And But they're more worried about what other people think of them than their own evil in many instances. You'll see this when they're going to get defeated. They're more worried about the way they're going to be perceived in hell and the ridicule and everything they're going to go through in hell than they actually are the brutal beating they're going through in the sessions. All the while, they're seeking honor. The reason they want to possess people is because they want honor. What's honor? Honor is the praise for excellence. What's excellence? Uh, that is, excellence ultimately is in virtue for human beings, in doing the right, in having innocence of will and things of that sort. That's where excellence is. And so for them, they want the honor without the excellence. Glory is the manifestation of that excellence. And so they want a certain glory, but the excellence that they're only worried about is power. They're not interested in actually being good or actually being understood in their true nature. They just simply want to be perceived as powerful. And so possession for them is a matter of honor. Demons are entitled to no honor or glory because of the fact that they have no excellence. Communists are very similar in that regard. They cause tremendous damage and do more harm to the common good, and yet they are concerned about how people view them. They're literally behind the scenes doing maximum damage. They maximize the damage within their ability to do so, but at the same time, they expect prestige in the eyes of other people and in the public and by the news media. They do not learn from their mistakes, but simply move to some other thing where they can cause more damage. That is, they don't change themselves for the better. So a sinner is only really trying to groom his perception, people's perception of him, and that's what they, these people are. They're more worried about people's perception of them than they actually are, because the perception, of course, is a means to power. But they're more concerned about that than they are whether they're actually being good people or not. And so, in the end, they don't change themselves for the better, but only seek to impose their will in regard to the revolution. Nevertheless, they spend extraordinary amounts of energy controlling the propaganda machine and public news outlets in order to make sure that their image is perfect and upright. Because they do not seek excellence nor engender excellence either in themselves or others or in society, they are due no honor. Just like demons, communists are not honorable people. Communists have a very determinate way of proceeding and taking over a country and how they deal with their enemies. And we will discover in this series of videos that how they proceed is the same as demons proceed. That is, communists and demons have the same methodology. And so in this third part, we want to talk about the method of proceeding that is used both by demons and by communists. Demons tempt people in order to get them to commit sin. That's the ultimate goal, is to offend God because they are uh, they, they took their fall personally, and they're mad at God for not giving them what they wanted, and so they want to lash out at God. They can't do it directly, of course, but they want to do it indirectly by getting us to do it. And this is they, are, they do this so they can get their foot in the door. In other words, whenever they commit a sin, whenever a person commits a sin, he opens the door to diabolic influence in his life. And the reason is, is because through the sin... He takes himself out from under the authority structure of God, which is part of the divine law, and he places himself under the authority or under the order of Satan by his disorder. He has to corrupt the person's morals. Demons need to corrupt the person's morals in order to compromise them, um, or he needs to compromise them morally in order to get his foot in the door. So, unless God gives 
some type of permission like he did with Job, as we read in the book of Job, for Satan to attack, even though Job hadn't done anything wrong. This is extraordinarily rare. Usually demons get into people's lives either because they themselves, uh, the person that is, has committed some type of grave sin, so the demon's got his foot in the door through that sin, or he commits some grave atrocity against someone else, and that gets the foot in the door. Communists, in relationship to communists, Fulton Sheen once said that the communists only take over a country when there is moral corruption. In other words, you can't, they can't enter into a culture in which uh, there is strong moral life because of the fact that the communist principles would just be categorically rejected, such as the uh, elimination of private property, the destruction of the culture in order to rebuild it, the removal of the government and things like that. People of up moral up rectitude simply wouldn't stand for that kind of thing. And so the only time that the communists can actually uh, infiltrate or take over a country is when there is some degree of moral corruption, at least among some of its citizenry. If you read the communist goals for America, this was, there were 45 of them that were listed in 1963. In 1963, there was a congressional record which listed the 45 goals for communism to achieve in America. This is what they wanted to do in the United States. People have this idea that somehow or another we'll never become communist. Uh, these people are working hard at it, and they've been working at it for almost a 100 years, and they've made significant inroads. We're not going to go into all of them here because there's simply too many of them, but they're definitely worth reading. You can get them right off the Internet. Just a basic search of the 45 communist goals for America, and it'll it'll come up. The one I do want to look at, though, is number 25. It says, quote, this is, I should say, these. this is the goal of uh, the communists in the United States, quote, break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV, unquote. In other words, they, need, they knew they need to break down the moral fabric of this country before they would be able to infiltrate it or take it over or conquer it. In the end, both demons and communists' method of proceeding revolves around moral corruption and is based upon it. If a country or nation finds itself under full attack from communists with, within the country, it is a sign that they have perceived that that country has already been morally compromised. Leo XIII, in his document Exuente Yam Anno, makes the following observation, quote, In this way we daily see the numerous ills which afflict all classes of men. These poisonous doctrines have utterly corrupted both public and private life. Rationalism, materialism, atheism have begotten socialism, communism, nihilism. Evil principles, which not only fittingly sprung from such parentage, but were its necessary offspring. Unquote. Given the content of this quote, if one analyzes it, what's the difference between this and the way demons behave? When one looks at the patterns that demons exhibit in their behavior, there are various patterns you see. There's all sorts of kinds, but one of them that you notice is that demons tend to be like flies. Once one of them gets in, he tries to get his buddies in as well. They constantly try to get in, and the reason they do this is for a few reasons. One is they think that there's safety in numbers, so the more they get in, the more likely to it. Sometimes it's because of the fact that the one of the higher demons, once a lower demon gets in, the higher demon will hammer him until he does something in order to drive the person to open up the door to that particular demon. But the real reason they try and get in is so they can take charge, control, and manipulate the individual. If you look in Wikipedia, again, not that I think that Wikipedia is a reliable academic source, but if you look in Wikipedia under Marxism, we read, quote, 
Marxism has had a profound impact on global academia, having influenced many fields, including anthropology, archaeology, art theory, criminology, cultural studies, economics, education, ethics, film theory, geography, historiography, literary criticism, media studies, philosophy, political science, psychology, science studies, sociology, and theater, unquote. This is by design. They get into everything. They're like demons in the sense that, uh, w you know, once they get into one place, they get their other buddies in it, and they try and infiltrate literally every aspect and uh, every part of culture. Bella Dodd, in her book, The School of Darkness, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you read it, makes the observation that communists basically took over the education system in this country. That was one of the first things they did. They now dominate the universities and public school systems. This is not conspiracy theory or rocket science. You can just read it on the internet without hardly any, ba just a basic search will render that up. And so when we see that they have dominated the public school systems and the universities, why should we wonder why the kids today are essentially trained socialists? I mean, this is what their training was. The goal was to take over one of the political parties in this country that was also mentioned in the 45 goals of communism in relationship to this country was to take over one of the political parties in this country, which they did, as well as a majority of uh, others, according to Bella Dodd and other authors. In other words, they took over an, an enormous amount of the, of the political segment in this country. The deep state is just another name for communism. That is their goals, structure, and they, because they do the same thing. They're in the news media. They've gotten into everything. Even Bella Dodd talks about or gives testimony of having uh, infiltrated the seminaries and clergy in the Catholic Church with a thousand seminarians. This is what they, this is the goal they did before Vatican II. People wonder why there was such a moral and a doctrinal collapse among the clergy in the Catholic Church, you know, at the time of Vatican II and afterwards. Well, there's part of the reason why, at least in this country. And if I understand correctly, she also said they did it worldwide. Uh, the degrees of success, I think, varied from country to country. The point being is, is that one of the signs of, a commun of communism in a country is the fact that they've infiltrated virtually every facet and aspect of that culture. That's their goal, because once they get those taken over, then they can assert themselves and then have their revolution. Demons will, A, try to insert themselves as an authority in some respect. That is, they will try and assert that, hey, look, this is, I have the rights here and you have to obey me, etc. when they don't have it, have the authority. Or B, they will use the structure of authority to manipulate people. For example, using obedience in which a superior gives a command, which is ultimately harmful to the individual or to the community. But he does it because he thinks he has to. In other words, the inferior obeys, thinking, well, I have to obey. This is something that was actually used within the Catholic Church, that once the communists got into certain key positions, they started using the obedience as a battering ram to force guys to accept changes and things of this sort that were ultimately harmful to the church. Demons try to get people into key positions of authority over whom they have control. In other words, they have a guy that they have control and they try and manipulate the situation by affecting people's perceptions to get a particular individual in a position of power. And then as a result, they can easily manipulate him to derail the institution, country, or the church. Communists use the authority structure in place to undermine it. That's their that's what they, they look at the thing, they see what its weaknesses are, they see how to use it, and they use it against their enemies. For example, getting into key positions in a political party to drive out others in the party. The flooding of the judiciary in this country with people who ignore the Constitution. So that, why? Because if we're going to follow the Constitution, we can't end up communists. So you have to, you ultimately have to uh, get people who will adjudicate contrary to the Constitution in order to promote the various aspects of communism. Or even the rule of law in the adjudication. So they just simply ignore the rule of law. Because why? Their obedience, communists' obedience, is to nothing other than the Communist Party. That's it. It's not to any rule or law or policy or what have you. 
There's a lot of talk about the deep state, but the deep state, regardless of the various other things that it is, is communist. And how do we know this? Because of their behavior. They do the same things that communists do by undermining the rule of law, by adjudicating things that are contrary to the law uh, or the Constitution, by trying to oust people that have gotten into positions of power, etc. In a word, their behavior is communist, just as their behavior is the same as demons. When demons want something, they constantly barrage the individual in order to get it. In other words, they're unrelenting. And they have their, uh, you know, the person finds himself under constant attack. It just seems unrelentless. You can't seem to get out from underneath it. When they are told no, that is when the demons are told no, they protest vociferously as if somehow or another their rights are being violated or somehow or another that that you're holding something them to which they have a right, if they think they can still get it. In other words, if they think that they can obtain something from the person, if they realize they're not going to get it, then they just go somewhere else because they're somewhat efficient in their um, process of uh, attack or in their uh, engaging in the spiritual warfare. But if they think they can get it, they become very vociferous in their protesting. Communists, in a using... In addition to using the power structure, they use the various mechanisms within a culture to advance their cause. In other words, they take a look at the, the lay of the land and they say, this will work to our advantage. They use the right of free speech to protest. And we've mentioned this already that, you know, they protest. They begin the practice of protesting incessantly. In other words, when they protest, they simply don't stop because they want to wear people down and bludgeon them into accepting. They know that most people, most people will very often, after they've been constantly harangued about something, simply give the thing to the individual to shut them up. Well, in a very similar way, the, the communists do the same thing as the demons. If they think they can gain something, they just continuously, vociferously protest. So it's protest, 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 and it just doesn't seem to stop. To give you the sense that, you know, that, that you ultimately, they're just going to wear you down. It is for this reason that Saul Alinsky, in the Rules for Radicals, states in rule number eight, keep the pressure on, never let up. Demons create crises in two ways. The first, by slowly building up the pressure so that it gets to the point where it reaches a crisis level. In other words, they just keep the pressure on until the person finally snaps. Or by broadsiding the individual with a form of attack which destabilizes him, his psychological situation, briefly, even if just briefly, during which time they can then take advantage of the individual. In other words, they create the crisis so that the person isn't in a position to defend themselves or to maintain an orderly conduct. Communists do the same thing. They create crises in the exact same way as demons do. One, they slowly build up the pressure, which gets to the point where it uh, gets to a crisis level. For example, the constant protesting and then rioting, which is then the next step because the rioting follows the protesting. And then after that, the governmental overthrow. So that's kind of the progression. This is what we have learned from them and observing their histor historically in other countries. You just look at this as how they've proceeded. So they're doing the same thing in the United States. And that's another sign that it's diabolic because demons are phenomenally consistent, even though to us as human beings, they seem random. And that's only because of the fact that we don't understand their tactics and methodology. They are phenomenally consistent. They always tend to doing the same thing over and over again. It's just that we as human beings are pretty clueless, and so we tend to get suckered in by them. The other way that communists do it is by creating false flags. And false flags are of two kinds. First, they do some kind of terrorist activity or some kind of traumatizing event in a localized area. And then from that, they use it politically to advance their agenda. In other words, they create the problem and then provide, act as if they are the solution to the problem. 
So they create the crises and then blame others for the crises and act that they are the only solution to the crisis. The second type of false flag is something which they did not cause, but which is a terrorist act or which did cause trauma or difficulty for a particular uh, culture, location, society, which is traumatizing in such a way that they take advantage of it. This is why Rahm Emanuel made the observation, never let a crisis go to waste. In other words, he was not interested in the well-being, just as demons are not interested in the well-being of the individual that they are attacking. Communists are not interested in the well-being of the people under them. They're only interested in how they can make use of these crises in order to advance their agenda. Creating crises and false flags is nothing new. It's historically, it's been around for millennia and has many precedents in history, but the communists have perfected the process. Demons love to cause others to suffer because misery loves company, as well as envy of other people's goods. In other words, demons... Demons cause us suffering for two reasons. One is because they're miserable and they don't want anyone else to, they don't want to be around somebody who's happy. It's the same, we, human beings are not that different in the respect that if we're not feeling well and someone comes in and they are all uh, giddy and chipper and happy, and th there's an, a dissonance that it causes in us in being around them. But the other part of it is, and so they want their company. They want to feel like everyone, since everyone else is suffering, they don't feel so bad about their suffering. And also envy. They want other people's goods. They want, they don't want other people to have these things that are good. In fact, envy is a vice in which an individual desires the good of another to the degree that the other person is made bereft of that good. And so that's their goal is to take it from them so that they actually end up having it. And if they can't have it, they still don't want the other person to have it either. They also have no difficulty in using the suffering of others to benefit themselves when they have absolutely no compassion for people who suffer. Demons don't care about your suffering. They will even attack when you're suffering the most. In fact, that's usually when they're suffering because they also know that when you're suffering the most is when you're the weakest. In the end, it's all about power for them. They don't care at the fact that they victimize the innocent, the powerless, the people who are suffering. In fact, they look for those kind of people and prey on them because it empowers them. Because ultimately, they want to empower themselves against you or over you. Communists are very similar. They have no problem making your life miserable or even intentionally causing people suffering. Paul Kangor in The Devil and Karl Marx recounts a suffering of Richard Rombrandt, which I think is worth reading. I'm just going to read this section to give people a sense of this is how communists function. To that end, Marx and Satan is the unapologetic title of a decidedly politically incorrect look at the life of Karl Marx by the late Richard Rombrandt, who spent 14 years imprisoned behind the Iron Curtain for his opposition to atheistic communism. The Roman the Romanian pastor was brutally tortured with what he described as little demonic zeal, so horrible, so unthinkably cruel, with such diabolic imagination by his Marxist captors that the good reverend can be forgiven for any hyperbole and for sensing that the dark spirit of the devil himself seemed to be oozing out of his tormentors. Quote, All the biblical descriptions of hell and the pains of Dante's Inferno are nothing in comparison with the tortures of communist prisons, unquote, stated Wombrand, in his international bestseller, Tortured for Christ. He recalled of his captors, quote, I have seen communists whose faces, while torturing believers, shone with rapturous joy. They cried out while torturing the Christians, We are the devil. He remembered one torturer saying, I thank God, in whom I don't believe, that I have lived to this hour, when I can express all the evil in my heart, unquote. So this gives us a sense of the type of attitude that communists have towards suffering. They have no problem making other people suffer to achieve their ends. They have no compassion for the very people that they are claiming that they are helping. If, if socialists and communists, especially some among the young, honestly believe that ushering in communism is going to bring in a golden age, 
they are sorely mistaken. One of the things that exorcists observe is that demons try and control every single aspect of our lives. In my book on psychology, called The Introduction to the Science of Mental Health, I make the observation in uh, one of the chapters in the third part about how people who try and control everybody else is is the product of them having no internal self-control. In other words, because they can't control themselves, they have to control everybody else in order to feed this app, these their appetites of what they want. Demons use temptation versus other forms of diabolic attack to slowly gain control over the individual. In other words, demons will use various forms of temptation to slowly kind of gain control over the individual. And if you give in to them, you've already ceded a little bit of power or area in your life to them. Their ultimate goal is to control every aspect of a person's life and to eventually have him in hell under him. Because if a demon managed to get gets you to commit the sin for which you are damned, you are under him in hell. And they want that way they can control you for the rest of eternity because you're under them. And in hell, the, there's no love, no good, no nothing except power. So everything is about power. Communists, in relationship to them, there is no aspect of a person's day-to-day -day life which they don't want to have absolute and complete control. You see this in the, our government right now. There's not a single area of our life that isn't taxed, that isn't trying to be controlled, that isn't trying to be uh, manipulated, or that they're trying to position themselves in order to have complete control of literally every aspect of our lives. This is why they are developing technology and working with people that are heads of technological companies in order to attract, control, as well as spy on people continuously. They basically want to maximize their control. Why? Because communism is not a system which persuades the masses. It persuades a percentage of the people. Certain people will sign off or uh, give assent to the ideas of communism, but in the end, a majority of the people realize it's a bogus political system or in a bogus way of looking at life and philosophically, etc. And so the only way they can maintain the power, because eventually the people will just simply overthrow them. The only way they can maintain power is by having complete control over every aspects of people's lives. You cannot control somebody if you don't know what they're doing. This is why they want to develop all sorts of forms of surveillance and keeping track of people. Just as with demons, one wants to control someone else is the product of himself being out of control. In other words, there is great moral corruption among communists. You can read that among the people who have been in it and gotten out. They don't have interior virtue and discipline and self-control. They have a kind of diabolic discipline in trying to achieve their agenda, but not in the area of moral lives. So when it comes to relating with other people, they don't have any internal discipline and can't relate to people with that discipline. So they ultimately want to basically take away everybody's freedom in relationship to choosing what they're going to do. In other words, they don't want people to have a certain amount of freedom. Those who are communists try to control people. And this is a sign that they themselves lack interior control and a certain amount of interior freedom to be able to take or leave something. In other words, part of a person having a certain amount of virtue in relationship to something is they can take it or leave it. Whereas a person who has vice, they're just constantly inclined towards it and they can't resist in relationship to it. And this gives us an indication that communism is a vicious system. When a person or a group of people, that is a movement like communism, seeks to control people, it's a sign of viciousness, ultimately. Both demons and communists cannot live and let live. They're both compulsive and try to control others. That's one of the ways that you can discern a communist. If he cannot live and let live, that's a pretty good sign he's a communist. Because demons do not have bodies, they don't get tired, and so they don't sleep. They don't need to sleep. And so they're constantly watching what is going on in this life that is in this world. In other words, because they have 
they don't they don't sleep they don't need to sleep and they're constantly thinking their focus tends to be on this world because they're trying to undermine god because this is where god is active in some cases the demon is constantly watching a particular individual. In other words, you can have demons who spend virtually all their existence or uh, current existence uh, watching just one individual so that he can constantly observe what graces God gives to the individual, what his habits are, what his tendencies are, you know, what his gifts and talents are so that he can tempt him and manipulate him by that knowledge. In other words, he's trying to gain knowledge to have power over the individual. Communists set up vast spy networks and train people to spy on each other and, and to narc on each other. We saw this just recently with COVID where uh, people who are in charge of certain parts of the government were encouraging the various citizens to narc on each other in relationship to the COVID breaches of the COVID lockdown. Again, the ultimate goal is control. There is no true privacy with demons. Demons are watching us, right? They know they can't understand. They can't, they don't know our thoughts. And so in that sense, they can't know what's going on, but they can, they're watching us externally. And so in relationship to demons, um, uh, there's no privacy in relationship to them, ultimately, unless God blocks it, of course. With communists, they want to strip and remove all forms of privacy except that kind of privacy which promotes sin, disorder, and their activities. There is no true privacy, although they claim privacy when they want to be able to do some kind of evil activity, and they don't want other people to know about it. Demons can only attack if God permits it. But normally speaking, the attack, whenever he does permit it, is moderated. In other words, demons are on a very short leash. However, at times, people's experience is such that it seems like they are under constant attack. And so it seems like the demon is constantly there. God is still moderating the, the, the demon. But it's a sign that God is trying to build up a certain virtue in the individual. Even how evil the world is becoming, some people have observed that it seems like the demons are almost everywhere. But this is not true. Demons aren't under every rock. They might be under every other rock, but they're not under every rock. And the point being is, is that they only can influence us to the degree that God permits. However, that doesn't mean that from time to time, God will not allow demons to be to attack an individual in such a manner that the person's experience seems like that it's constant. It seems, it seems almost to the person that God is not there, God's not helping them, when in point in fact, no, he's, he's still got the demon on a leash, he's just letting them do certain things. Communists try to make one think that their, uh, that their influence the things that they're promoting, the lifestyles that they're promoting are ubiquitous. They want to give the impression that what they're promoting is everywhere. This is true in relationship to homosexuality, in which they appear all over the news media, in movies, on TV, on the internet, so that it seems like there's far more many of them than the reality of the actual statistic. So the point being is that it seems like they're everywhere. The same is true of the LGBT movement. They're constantly parading these people up in the news media. It seems like these, th these people are everywhere. It's also the same thing in relationship to the writing. It seems like it's going on everywhere and everybody's talking about it. When point in fact, it's actually confined to a certain groups and areas, even within a particular city. But that doesn't mean it won't continue to spread if nothing's done about it. Demons do this in order to demoralize the person and make someone feel like he is a victim and so that they will give up, that they become hopeless, that they can't crush this thing. In other words, demons constantly attack in order to get you to give, to give up. Because they are under constant attack, they don't feel like there's anything they can do, and so they might as well surrender. Communists do it for the exact same reasons. Part of the reason that demons want the person to feel like they just can't seem to get away from them or that they are under constant attack 
uh, everywhere, you know, and all the time. It just doesn't seem so no matter what happens, they and what, what they do, they just can't seem to get out from underneath them. It's in order to get the person to stop looking at the situation rationally and to begin react emotionally. Demons spend an enormous amount of time and energy fostering the mindset in people that they must follow their emotions. This idea that, well, I have to follow my heart, or this idea of, you know, if I don't follow my emotions, they'll cause fears because then, then they're going to suffer and this and that. Since demons have access to and influence the person's emotions, once a person follows his or her emotions, then essentially speaking, the demons have control over them. This is how that works. Because demons have access to our emotions, those who follow their emotions are easily manipulated by the emotions. Over the course of time, the person rationally begins to, uh, the person begins to become irrational. That is, over the course of time, if they keep following their emotions, they're going to stop following reason, and then they're going to become irrational. And the person literally loses his mind. That is, becomes insane, which makes him even more vulnerable to diabolic attack and manipulation. Communists call the, they, they constantly use the uh, class warfare or the class struggle um, in which they pit some people against other. They always do it in emotional terms. The news media, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the news media constantly puts people up in front of the camera who are all emotional, um, bef uh, you know, in order so that when they're interviewed, it will have, it will cause people to emotionally connect with them. They want the person to question their sanity. That is the communist when it comes to particular topics or issues. In other words, you see this, even though they, they lob these bombs of that person's insane, that person's not mentally competent or, or what have you, but they themselves are following their emotions. They want you to follow your emotions, but this isn't a prescription because that's how they manipulate you. They know that. They want to destroy the reasoning process. They don't want people who are very rational, logical, and proceed by rational principle. They don't want that. They want to get people to follow their emotions. Because if you follow rational principle, you're never going to end up a communist. Once people begin acting emotionally, then through control of the means of propaganda and the news media outlets, they can essentially manipulate people and socially engineer the culture. So the way in which they manipulate people and socially engineer the culture is by getting them to follow their emotions. We have already noted that demons will accuse others of what they are guilty. And this is just hypocrisy, right? And so they will say things which uh, they themselves are actually doing when they shouldn't be actually saying anything at all. The demons do not want the same rules applied to them that they want to apply to you. They want to make you do certain things, but they don't want to have to suffer that same thing. Demons want to appear morally upright. They want to seem justified in what they did, even in their choice in which they offended God. They want to appear justified in their behavior at all times. Communists' rules do not apply to them. In other words, with communists, rules don't apply to them, but only to their opponents or others. This is one of the reasons why we are seeing such a large number of millennials becoming socialistic and communistic in their mindset. And the reason being is, is because they were trained this way, not necessarily consciously, but in some cases explicitly, but most of the time not. So, for example, when he was in school, he would act up. And as a result, he would get sent to the to the uh, principal's office, and then what would happen? The mother or the father would come down and defend the child instead of punishing him for acting up, which is what he should have done. He defended the child, so he realizes that rules don't apply to him. The effects of your bad behavior don't, aren't, don't redound to you. So you just do whatever you want. Well, communists, that's why communism in the millennial generation, there's a kind of a hand-in-glove thing kind of going on there. 
And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that with all uh, millennials. I'm just saying that a lot of them, that's their mindset. The hypocrisy is blatant. People have to understand they do not that communists do not work off of the same morality, standards of behavior, or mental framework as normal people. They're not working off a basic rational approach to social interaction and government. That is, the average person on the street just acts pretty much by the natural law. I mean, yeah, he's sinful and he does a little bit of disorder, but he acts according to the natural law. The communists don't function that way. They control the media outlets so that the hypocrisy cannot be called into question or that the agents of communism will not have their reputation destroyed by their hypocrisy. Normally, you cannot call them out on their hypocrisy or moral corruption. In other words, if you try and point it out, uh, their, tr the, their true motives, they'll either block you, shut you down, or if you manage to get it out there where you show, hey, look, you are completely contradictory in your behavior, they'll just poo-poo it, or they just openly deny it. They act like it doesn't exist. This results in increasing frustration on the side of those who are reasonable within a culture. So as co communists begin to start gaining greater and greater control over a culture, normal people get more and more frustrated. Communist agents always have the appearance of being morally upright, but constantly sow discord and cause damage. Demons drive the person insane to control them. Communists drive people insane by contradiction, hypocrisy, uh, pushing things that are contrary to the natural law, and forcing people to accept the stuff that they know is not rational or reasonable. Common sense is defined as the ability to grasp the nature of a thing. So, by way of example, we know someone doesn't have common sense. It is just ability to see how things are connected and how they relate. Uh, for, when, for example, someone is holding a cigarette in their hand and they go to, oh, uh, they open up their gas tank, take the handle and start pumping gasoline with the cigarette in their hand. When we see something like that, we know this person doesn't have any common sense because they don't grasp the nature of the volatility of the gasoline vapors coming from the gas tank. We realize this person doesn't understand what they're actually doing. Demons, by getting people to follow their emotions and by constantly affecting how they view things by putting that perspective on them in their imagination and on the various things that the demons want to influence, slowly erode a person's common sense. Why? Common sense is the ability to grasp the nature of a thing. It means you have to be in contact with reality because reality is where we learn the nature of the thing from. I can't know the nature of a dog or a cat or something of that sort without being in contact with reality. I can imagine all sorts of things about dogs and cats, but that has nothing to do with reality. But ultimately, the demon's through following your emotions, because what emotions do, they cause what's called contraction. They cause the individual to look inwards instead of actually looking at the reality of the situation. And so what happens is, is by doing that over the course of time, they erode people's connection to reality and their common sense. By controlling the propaganda machine and by controlling the news media outlets, Communists control how people view things and constantly manipulate them emotionally. Over the course of time, they destroy people's common sense. You can just see this. Just think about it. When they propose that if you wipe out all private property, that as a result of that, there will be a utopia, you have to wonder what these people are smoking. It, ha it, ha it has no connection to common sense whatsoever. We know that in order for people to have a certain sense of well-being, peacefulness, and security, that they have to have their own private property because if they don't, they can. There's there's nothing they can hold on to, or it could shifts around unless they're perfect, like such as in the case of a saint in relationship to God, that they can perfectly rest in God. But most people aren't that way. They will often propose things, not just the hypocritical. The things that are completely contradictory are completely incapable of being true, and yet they expect you to believe it. Even when they, you know they're lying, they expect you just to accept it and lump it. Goebbels once said, If you keep saying the lie enough, eventually people will believe it. 
This is the destruction of common sense because people stop believing their own eyes and their own rational conclusions and give assent to things that are fictitious and made up. Communists erode common sense as a way to tear down the society. Demons do it to tear down the individual. This is done to make it more capable of being ma manipulated. So again, both with communists and with demons, it's all about the power. Demons, by causing pleasure to an individual in the temptation, try to erode the person's discipline, that is, his strength or virtue in doing the good. This is in order to make them more manipulatable and to get them to do things which will offend God. So ultimately, it's about giving them what they want or giving them pleasure in order to erode the person's discipline. Through, quote, science, unquote, or by various other means, they propose things, that is, communists propose things, and we see this even among uh, supposed scientists, propose things which will ultimately erode the discipline of a culture. They might not have to come up with the idea, but they definitely capitalized on it. That is, communists don't necessarily didn't come up with the idea of these things that would erode the discipline of a culture, but they still capitalize it, pun intended. For example, no spanking, no correcting the kids, etc. Communists know that that destroys the person's fortitude and discipline. If a child is not corrected, he doesn't, he doesn't become orderly interiorly and psychologically and morally. And as a result, his inclinations are simply to do what he wants, which is going to lead to vice and lack of discipline. Part of the reason that we notice this is that the educational systems, which are controlled by the communists and the news media outlets, push the narrative that children should not uh, respect, uh, that, that they should not have respect or be disciplined. In other words, they are not, they're not corrected. They shouldn't be disciplined. And you see this, for example, when you go on an airplane and the parents can't spank the child publicly because it's considered abuse. And so as a result of that, the kid is simply out of control. I don't know how that's not absolutely cruel to the parents because they have to sit there and suffer everyone's appropriate because their kid is out of control. He's just a kid. He's not necessarily bad or evil. He's just a kid. But they erode common sense by equating all punishment of children to abuse, all correcting of children to abuse, not by being able to make the proper distinction between abuse and correction, because their ultimate goal is the weakness of those they rule, just like the demons. One of the things that demons do is that they attack the institution of marriage. And we're going to come back to that later in this series. But for now, the reason that we want to observe that they attack marriage is in order to harm and damage the children. Because they know if they can harm them or damage them in relationship to the marriage of the parents, that when they're young, then they will have a greater opportunity to possibly control them in the future. In other words, when people are wounded or damaged, that is, because that's what wound is. Wound is a kind of a damage on the skin, etc. But it's the same thing true in relationship to psychology. Demons know that if you can wound a person when they're young, their psychological faculties don't function in a normal way. And as a result of that, they're more easily controllable and manipulatable. Sin Trauma, abuse on the side of parents and others is the way in which children are formed in the minds of the demon to be susceptible to doing whatever they want them to do. In other words, you just weaken them, and then that way you can just control them. Bella Dodd observed that one of the first institutions that the communists took over in the United States was the educational system. Communists know that you have to go after the children in order to gain control and the formation of the children and the direction that the children are likely to go politically. It, quote, takes a village. Constant government involvement or control over the children 
their education, etc., is what communists try to do. They want to control. The, in fact, parents are viewed as bad. You have to get them away from the parents in order to form them. This is one of the clearest signs of Marxist communist thinking. Communists have a long-term plan. They're very patient. Just like demons are very patient. They will take their time to build their case. Communists have a long-term plan. Uh, and it is necessary in the public order to combat them that those who have vigilance over the nation, their family, etc., must be willing to have longevity. They must be willing to go the distance. It's not something you're just going to clear out and then you're done. Battling communists once they've gotten in is a long-term process. In their willingness to maintain vigilance, people have to be willing to be able to maintain a vigilance and to fight for the good of their children so that the communists don't end up making their lives miserable. One of the common warfare tactics is simply to divide and conquer. So if you can break off a segment of a battalion from the rest of the battalion, you can very often take them out much more quickly. And this is one of the primary tactics that demons use, is to divide and conquer. Now, this is done by making the individual feel like he is alone, that there's nobody who shares his view or understands him. Division is first brought about by affecting people's perceptions. You see this in marriage all the time. The first thing that demons do is attack the perceptions that the spouses have of each other in order to divide them psychologically, and then the division in them uh, externally in the marriage can happen later but you have to first divide them psychologically. You cannot get people to divorce each other unless their perceptions of each other are contrary to the reality or contrary to the individual. Division is brought up about by affecting the perception of the individual in relationship to others for others in relationship to the individual or others in relationship to the individual. So basically what this means is it's all about perceptions. In the Communist Manifesto, at the very root of the, the full foundation of the Communist Manifesto is based upon a class struggle. So it pits one class against another by its very thing. The first thing it tries to do is, is get people's perceptions that they're against each other. That's the first thing that it does. It does it by class warfare, which is just a form of divide and conquer. This is also why communists cause division by race when it doesn't need to be. They cause division by uh, various other aspects, by ethnicity, by country of origin, etc. They are causing the division, that, uh, and they cause this by, in the division in the news media outlets by constantly talking about the racial divide. If you keep talking about it, you'll start affecting people's perceptions about our country. So, this is why Morgan Freeman said one of the first ways to stop having difficulties among race relations is to stop talking about it, right? Let things settle down because the constant talking about it maintains the perceptions. And as a result, the communists use that in order to divide and conquer. Part of the reasons for the hypocrisy and double standards is to foment unrest. We've talked about hypocrisy and double standards. The reason they do that is to foment unrest and division. When people see that politicians get to commit crime after crime after crime and nothing is ever done about it, over the course of time, and there's a double standard that they get to do stuff that other people don't get to do. You know, they get to go have their hair done when other people don't get to have their hair done. Things like that. Or they get to go to walk in a park, as one mayor recently did after he had closed down the parks. People that divide is done in order to create the division. They do it on purpose to create the division so that it can be used. Now, sometimes they're just doing it for selfish reasons, but in the end, the communists use that because then they can use that as to create the strife in which they can then seize power. Anytime you see people trying to create division, it's a pretty good sign that you're dealing with a communist or a communist group. One of the things that exorcists notice among demons is their animus delendi, which is a Latin phrase which means the desire to destroy. Demons desire to destroy everything that reflects God in any way because of their hatred for God, and this is why they want to destroy everything. 
The Animus Delendi is not just a desire to destroy, but it's almost a compulsion, not just a desire, but a compulsion in which a person is driven to destroy everything he gets his hands on. We've already seen this in, in this, in the case in relationship to demons insofar as they maximize damage within the context, uh, or in the, in, in the context in which they are capable. Demons are incapable of seeking the good of an individual, society, cultural, or nation. They're just incapable because they're bent on evil. It is a sign of malice. Malice is, is defined by St. Thomas Aquinas as when a person chooses the lesser good over the greater good. Now here we're talking about, like for example, we tend to think as malice as when the person intentionally chooses evil. The philosophers are very clear. People are not capable of including e choosing evil as such. They can only choose evil under the aspect of the good. And that's what we're talking about, that the person becomes malicious because they choose evil under the aspect of the good rather than choosing the true good. And so as the mal as the person makes choices in relationship to the malice, in relationship to the demons, that means that once they made their choice of the lesser good, rather than doing the will of God, but doing the lesser good, their will became fixed in choosing and seeking after the lesser good. I've already mentioned that communists maximize damage in relationship to everything that they control. They try to, it doesn't matter what they get their hands on, they maximize the damage. They use destruction in order to cause division and strife within a culture so that they can take it over. That's what it is. Because when a culture becomes divided and become, and there's all this strife, in other words, they create the problem and then they step in as the solution to the problem. When there is strife, the culture is weak and so that's when they can overthrow it. At the root of communism is ultimately malice, not just in relationship to human beings, but to God and to anything that is good. Not everybody who has an animus delendi in their heart is a communist. And even some communists in the beginning stages actually enter it for what might be considered altru altruist motives. You know, they might have, they might have good reasons why they entered into it. By that good reasons, I mean they have goodwill. But eventually it turns out to be the case of the person slowly turning towards malice unless he realizes and gets out of it of the various communist movements. And we see that from time to time. Especially in cases of possession, exorcists have observed that the demon lies to let the possessed person know that he has them under their control. In other words, he just tells a person, You're, I have control of you, you belong to me, etc. And he likes to assert that there is nothing that they can do about it, that they just have to accept the fact that he is possessing them. Demons will also at times reveal to the person uh, what he's going to do with them, and then he will carry through with it. So in other words, once he realizes that he is in a position of strength or perceived strength and that he basically has control over the individual, he will simply tell them, this is what I'm going to do to you, right? This is, there's a book called The Hope of the Wicked. And then they talk about the revealing of the method. And you see the communists actually use this tactic. Once they have you under control, they like to reveal to you what they're actually doing. Now, you may not recognize what they're saying at the time or even take it because a lot of times people who are normal people who go to work eight to five and lead a normal life, when they tell them they're going to do X, Y, and Z, it's so foreign to them that they don't even, it, they don't even, it doesn't even compute. So they just kind of dismiss it. They will openly reveal what they're going to do once they have you under their control. And this is why a lot of stuff that we see coming out of the UN and other government agencies is completely open about their intentions. You can go on to their website and read things about various agendas and that type of thing. And it's a bit mind blowing because at this point, they already feel like they have us under their control. We've already discussed how demons will accuse the individual of various things, even though they're the ones that are actually guilty of it. In the structure of the accusation itself, the demon is trying to put the individual on the defensive so that he feels like the burden of proof is shifted from the accuser to the accused. 
And so that the demon himself in the allegation is the one that stands on sure footing. So the person feels like they have to defend themselves against it. One of the things that Kamas try to do is shift the burden of proof from the accuser to the innocent, that is to the accused. So the accused has to prove their innocence. We also see this insofar as they will accuse a person uh, enforcing the law. You see this, they're, they're attacking the police rather than the person who's actually committing the crime. They're in the process of committing the crime and the communists will actually back the person committing the crime. This is done in order to sow greater division. That is, when people feel, when people feel like the uh or when they're when the police are put on the, or the people that are enforcing the law are put on the uh on the defensive it makes people feel like they're even their government is supporting them or whatever the case may be in effect at the most fundamental level communism is basically thuggery that's all it is it's just thuggery at the most basic level communism is thuggery, and we know this from the fact that Saul Alinsky openly admits that he learned his tactics from the Mafia. The way Stalin, Lenin, and all and Mao, and all these people in killing their opponents and the way that they basically run roughshod over the people and things like that, in the end, what's really clear is that they, basically these people are thugs, and that's why they want the burden of proof shifted from the one enforcing the law because they're violating the law to uh, shifted to the person from the person who is violating the law they want it shifted from that from the individual violating the law to the person enforcing the law that way they can continue engaging in their thuggery Sometimes during a session in which you're doing a solemn exorcism over someone who is possessed, you'll get the point to the point where you can compel the demon to tell you his name. And sometimes they won't tell you immediately. They'll try and lie to you. But one of the things they will often do is claim to be Satan or they will claim to be Legion. And the reason they're doing this is to try and make it seem like they're more powerful than they actually are. Saul Alinsky, in his Rules for Radicals, states in rule number nine, quote, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself, unquote. Demons are cowards, and once one realizes that they are cowards, if you go on the offensive, you're more likely to defeat them. When dealing with diabolic temptation, if one simply tries to wave it off like a fly, they will simply ignore that. That is, the demons will ignore that and keep coming back after you, just like a fly does. Like the rope-a-dope, if you assume a defensive posture, the demons will come after you even more. It's only when you go after them on the offensive do they back off. With communists, if you assume a defensive posture, it will only result in non-stop attack from them. Only when you go on the full offensive do they back down communists do not respond to being blown off or accepting minor corrections they simply won't do it both demons and communists only quieten down and mind their p's and q's when they are when they are brutally suppressed unfortunately let that be a lesson to us in the united states trying to soft hand the various marxist groups and their various uprisings is only going to lead to more communist Marxist power grabbing and behavior. I have mentioned in this series that because demons made the choice in evil, their wills became fixed in evil. And so they promote every form of moral depravity under the sun. They do this by getting people not to follow the natural law or the divine positive law, that is the Ten Commandments. In fact, the natural law inclines man towards good activity, and so demons are the enemy of the natural law. Morality, in the Thomistic sense, is based upon the pursuit of happiness, and for St. Thomas, the demons chose to seek after their beatitude from their own natural means, that is, they wanted to achieve it on their own, independently of doing the will of God and God aiding them. 
Demons did the same thing in relationship to the temptation of Adam and Eve. Just like Satan and his temptation of Adam and Eve, who promised them knowledge independent of God, that is, he was selling them something which was completely false, and he knew it, the communists try to sell people on a utopia in which there is no private property or even government in which it is achieved by the destruction of all society structure, government, social mores, etc. A materialist philosophical and political system which in the end cannot grant man happiness because his true happiness cannot be anything material is a sign that communism is trying to sell us a bill of goods. Demons envy our life, or so some of the fathers say. And they envy the life that we have here because of the goods that we enjoy, and they don't enjoy those goods, or even the goods even in relationship to having some type of a relationship with God. And this is one of the reasons that they try to rob us of it. They don't want us to have it. Diabolic oppression by demons, seeks to destroy our finances, wealth, and property, even though they know we have a natural law right to our property, to our finances, to our relationships, to our reputation, and things of this sort. They seek to co-opt those things, to steal them from us in order to destroy them. By its very nature, communism and Marxism seeks to eliminate all private property, and this is one of the reasons why Leo XIII and other popes condemned it. It is a natural law inclination in us to own property, and it is necessary for the proper function of the family and society. Even though they claim they want to do away with all private property, historically, communists have always simply engaged in a massive wealth redistribution program in which they ended up with a property or high standard of living while everyone else was bereft of the basic necessities of life. Just that itself smacks of the way demons function in relationship to human beings. As I mentioned, that there is kind of a hand-in-glove relationship of communism to Marxism. Marx himself was really the first millennial. Because he leached off Ingalls and his parents, he didn't work, he didn't hold down a real job, and yet he expected others to basically support him while he didn't work. Marx thought he was entitled, and it is through the entitlement mindset that communists engender followers. We can see why the millennials are taught communism in the public school system would be attracted to communism. We can see why they're taught it, and we can see actually why they're attracted to it. My question is, is this. Do all these communists and Marxists, rioters, are all of them, don't they work for a living? I've already mentioned that demons attack the institution of marriage, and exorcists have noted that they really attack the sacrament as well as the natural law institution of marriage, especially in relationship if the person who's possessed is married. We've already mentioned that they go after the children, and this is because they also attack marriage because just as the father and the mother and the child are somewhat in the image of the Trinity, they go after it. One can simply look at the health of marriages or the family units within a culture to see the true health of that culture. They attack fatherhood because it is in the image of God the Father. One of the first things that communists did when they gained control of Russia was to ban the institution of marriage. This led to gargantuan economic and societal problems, and so they reinstituted it. They attacked it for the same reasons demons attack it, in order to go after the children. And also the way they attacked it was by saying that marriage was just a way to oppress women and things of this sort. Attacks in this country on the nature of fatherhood is very common among the news media and other propagandists of the communist mindset. Be wary any time someone is attacking marriage, and by marriage I mean between a one man and one woman, and any time they are attacking fatherhood, or even what it means to be a true woman, 
when they're attacking those things, it's a pretty good sign that they're a communist. We read in the book of Genesis that Satan actually tempted Eve. He went after her so that she would seek self-sufficiency and the ability to act independently of her husband. That's what he was offering her. From that point on, part of the punishment of women was to seek self-sufficiency independently of their husband and to have an aversion to their domestic work. The fact that they were dependent on their husband, they have an aversion towards it. Rather than seeing it as a form of providence in which men provide for them so that they can take care of their children, which is their natural eye inclination, this tendency after, which is part of the punishment of Eve and all women after Eve, this tendency towards having that aversion is a real thing. And demons play on this disordered inclination in women. They try and foster it. That's how they cause division within families, within society, and within culture. I want to read you a passage from Vladimir Lenin on an interview which he gave to Clara Zenkin called On the Woman Question, because this will give us a, a, a sense of the relationship that communism has to diabolic psychology. Quote, in law, there is naturally complete equity of rights of men and women, and everywhere there is evidence of a sincere wish to put this equality into practice. We are bringing the women into the social economy, into legislation and government. All educational institutions are open to them so that they can increase their professional and social capacities. We are establishing communal kitchens and public eating houses, laundries and repairing shops, nurseries, kindergartens, children's homes, educational institutes of all sorts. In short, we are seriously carrying out the demand in our program for the transference of the economic and educational functions of the separate household to society. That will mean freedom from, for the woman from the old household drudgery and dependence on man. That enables her to exercise to the full, to the full, her talents and her inclinations. The children are brought up under more favorable conditions than at home. We have the most advanced protective laws for women workers in the world, and the officials of the organized workers carry them out. We are establishing maternity hospitals, homes for mothers and children, mothercraft clinics, organizing lecture courses on children care, exhibiting or exhibitions teaching mothers how to look after themselves and their children, and similar things. We are making the most serious efforts to maintain women who are unemployed and unprovided for." Unquote. Communism demeans the value of the work women do domestically and in the raising of children by reducing them to simply another worker out in society. Women are then seen for their material contribution to society and reduced to an economic consideration rather than to their spiritual, moral, and educational value in raising their children and providing of a home life that brings joy to her, her husband, and her children. In the end, communism fosters hatred for feminine nature and the good it contributes to the family and to society. From what we've talked about, it's pretty clear that demons try to disorient the person morally and spiritually. They're always trying to derail them and to get them to fall into sin and to despair. They seek to destroy the basis of morality in the person's mind by constantly putting questions and doubts in there, or by inclining them to the evil things so that over the course of time, the person starts thinking it's okay. Demons constantly call into question the tenets of basic traditional morality. They will often act as if they are justified in the decision that they made to act contrary to God, and so they try and assume a position of moral superiority, as I've mentioned, and part of that requires them to call into question traditional morality. Communism is an atheist, atheistic system, so there are no morals. In the end, if there's no God, then uh, there's no moral law, and so anything goes. Lying is perfectly fine, fraud, stealing depressed, killing people, etc. 
they behave like demons insofar as demons lie, commit fraud, deceit, and do all that same kind of stuff. Because there is no basis for morality, and one can do anything one wants, the ends justify the means. Of course, communist and diabolic ends are never good anyway. But that means that because in their mind their end is good, they can do whatever they choose in order to get their end, to achieve their end. This is why they can be completely hypocritical, and there's no problem with it. You just have to accept it. Communists think that their goals are so lofty that they are morally superior to everybody else, and that's why whatever they do is okay. That's why they think they have the right to rule over you. From the very beginning, demons have sought to destroy religion, insofar as religion is a virtue by which one gives God his due, and they did not give God his due. That is above all true in relationship to the Catholic Church. The commonest view of the Catholic Church is that it is its primary nemesis, at least in the area of religion. Demons will do everything in their power to try and gain control within the Church, or to try to gain control over the Church by means of using civil authorities in order to cause problems with the church. This was seen in relationship to the civil authorities persecuting the church from the very beginning, and it having a following throughout history in which they tried to use the civil authorities in order to attack the church. They're even doing it now. Both communism and Satan, that is the demons, want the subjugation of the church to the civil authorities. The communists, for the sake of gaining power over the church, because they realize that the church stands in its way to bring about this utopia and destruction of private property, etc., and the cultures, and to eradicate one of its enemies, and Satan to eradicate his enemy. Separation of church and state is simply the battering ram, and the way in which the state gained ascendancy over the church. In other words, the state said, you can't tell, you can't tell the state what to do. Once they did that, once the state told the church there will be separation of church and state. The state assumed a position of authority over the church to be able to tell it what it must do in relationship to the, to the state. It was simply a power grab. And therefore, it can dictate to it what it wants, which became abundantly clear in the COVID lockdown when the civil authorities were dictating to the church what it can and cannot do. Communists only allow religion when it is under their thumb and does their bidding. We come to the end of this series on communism. I could have said a lot more. In fact, what I've said over the course of these videos is just the tip of the iceberg in how diabolic psychology and communist psychology are practically the same. And of course, then there's the whole fact that a person could spend volumes upon volumes of analyzing philosophically, economically, etc., the tenets of communism. But I want to end with this one note about Our Lady. We read in the book of Genesis 3.15 the following line, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush your head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. This was a warning of God to Satan that he was going to set up a woman who was going to be able to crush him in his work. God set Our Lady up as the nemesis of Satan, and she crushes him, not just him, but she crushes his work as well. When Our Lady appeared at Fatima on July 13th in 1917, she told Sister Lucy the following, quote, Russia will spread its errors throughout the world, rising up wars and persecutions against the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will suffer much, and various nations will be annihilated, unquote. The psychology of communism and demons is practically identical once one removes the veneer of the image that the communists portray of them and their system. In effect, communism is a thoroughly diabolic, philosophic, economic, and political system. It is no wonder that our Lord set Our Lady's Immaculate Heart up as the antidote to such a diabolic system. 
In other words, Our Lady said, if you consecrate Russia to my Immaculate Heart, then this would be averted. And so we know that the only way to crush the spread of communism is by Our Lady. I sometimes wonder, if Russia was consecrated, why is, why is it that Western culture is fighting for its very life against communistic Marxist movements trying to destroy it and take it over? Why hasn't Russia, if it truly converted, sought to eliminate the system which it dominated for hundreds of years or more? If it truly converted, it would realize the evil of communism and seek to help other countries overcome it. At this point, we know from the apparitions of Fatima that the only way Western civilization is going to stop and eliminate the errors of Russia is by Our Lady's intervention. She is not only the hope for Russia, at this stage, she is the hope for all nations.